and Michael Remus. What is up, everyone? Happy Friday to you, and welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you as we head into a huge weekend for the Winnipeg Jets down in Florida tomorrow night against Paul Maurice and the Panthers and Sunday against the Tampa Bay Lightning. We've actually been struggling, certainly for Lightning standards, over the last few weeks. Um, we've got a great lineup today. Scott Billick from the Winnipeg Sun is first up. We'll get uh, Scott's thoughts on the uh, current plight of the club as they head out on the road for this three-game roadie. And then Ken Weave is going to join us from Florida he was at practice today. We'll get the uh, lay of the land from Weber on the upcoming road trip as well as what he saw from practice and um, any comments available from head coach Rick Bonus maybe a little bit later on in the program. We will also, and I'm very looking forward to this, next Wednesday is AEW here in Winnipeg. All the Winnipeg guys, Omega, Chris Jericho, and Don Callis himself. And Callis is going to join us for a very fun conversation a little bit later on. And then, of course, it's Friday. And you know what that means. Marvel's time to finish off another big week here. A milestone week here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Um, and actually, I'll get to this when Remo jumps on. But we do have a chance to fill you in on how you can join us at AEW on Wednesday. But before we do that... Shout out to everyone listening on the podcast. If you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, when you get a chance, get on over to YouTube, pump in Winnipeg Sports Talk, and make sure you hit that red subscribe button. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you have subscribed and get on the uh, audio podcast as well. If you're not able to join us on the video portion of the show, uh, the latest WST content is always available just around 3.30 every afternoon in time for you to listen to us on your drive home from work. Huge thanks to the sponsors that make this program happen each and every day. Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Little Brown Jug, Culligan Water, Vita Health Fresh Market, Canadian Club Whiskey, Wallace & Wallace, Consolidated Supply, F Apparel, Manitoba Battery, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, and of course the Not Autocorp question of the day brought to you by Why Not? Not Autocorp, but Waverly and McGilbury. Let's get Remo in here and get things going. What uh, What's up? How, I, I'm in a much better state of mind given an extra day removed from that disappointing night at Canada Life Centre on Wednesday. And uh, uh, we got to talk about this team to see if they can pick up the bootstraps and get back in the win column on a very, very daunting road trip with their season and their playoff spot on the line. Yeah, the playoff hopes are well; they're still there. But the the um, sorry, one second, I had a problem with my camera. The <laughs> playoff percentage has been like ninety percent all season, and now it's kind of going down. You look at money puck; it's like what is it under eighty right now, and they just keep losing. As we said, 2-7-2 two, and two in their last 11 games. That's not going to get it done if you're a playoff team. And you, know, you saw Dallas put up 10 goals yesterday. Nashville did lose. I don't think they're really a threat. I think it's Calgary or bust here. And I don't know, the Jets control their own destiny, but they need to win games. And again, winning two of your last 11, that's not playoff team material. So uh, it doesn't get easier. You got who? Boston, Tampa. Florida, Carolina. I mean, these are the top teams in the league coming up, and the Jets are going to have to... What was the quote from um, Andrew Kopp? Like, strap your balls on and get to work? I think I have that on a button, actually. Yeah. Or you I know used, what? I used to. It, Let me the, see the if I have The balls need to be strapped on. Yeah. They oh, definitely need to be strapped on for this uh, <laughs> for this upcoming road trip. 
Yes. It, so I know Edmonton beat Boston yesterday, which was a shocker to everyone. But uh, we'll have to see what the Jets can do. And here, here, let's see if I have this. But this is from like last year. Oh wait, hold on, hold on. Sorry. I uh, know I'm just ruining this show. Are Take you gonna deep, be an anonymous? Strap on your balls and go to, to work. <laughs> Take deep. Strap on your balls and go to work. There you go. Thank you, Andrew Klopp. Andrew Klopp still providing leadership amongst at least the fan base of the of the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Jets there. I, I'm just looking at Money Puck right now. And Money Puck has loved the Jets all year long. Um, they've had big, big numbers when it comes to cup odds, like to actually get into the playoffs and make it through the playoffs. But this is absolutely bizarre right now. The Jets have seen their playoff odds go from like 96, 97 percent. Today, according to this model, again, take it for what it's worth, 71.5 percent to make the playoffs. They give them a 36.4% chance of making it through the first round. 18.9% to make it to the third round. 9.6% chance to make the final, which is better than Colorado. It's better than the Kings. Uh, It's better than the Vegas Golden Knights. And the Jets, they still give the Jets a 4.5% chance of winning the cup. What is bizarre, and again, someone far smarter than me that understands these models and numbers is going to have to explain this to me. The Calgary Flames have seen their percentage chance of making the playoffs move up to 49%. 26.5% to get to the second round. 15.2% third round. 9.2%, which again is bigger than a bunch of those teams that I just mentioned, including Colorado, and 4.9%, which is more than Winnipeg, to win the Cup. So I think this model thinks that Calgary and Winnipeg can both be very tough outs come playoff time. The big question is to who is actually going to get there. Um, and we're going to find out a lot about what this landscape of this playoff race is going to like over the course of this week. Because the Anaheim Ducks are playing the Calgary Flames tomorrow night. Calgary then hosts the Ottawa Senators, who did have a big bounce back win against the Kraken last night on the road out on the West Coast. And then the Coyotes, although the Coyotes game is in Arizona and the Coyotes have consistently been a team that has won at home. I mean, uh, I uh, did a little cool bet sprinkle on them last night against the Nashville Predators. They came through again. They're always an underdog at home. And yet their home record at Mullet Arena this year is 16, 11, and 3. Uh, that hasn't made up for a league worth seven wins on the road. 7, 21, and 7 so far for the Coyotes. Um, but yes, this is, to me, scoreboard watching every single night for what's happening with the Calgary Flames. But as much as what happens in Calgary is going to be impactful on this ream, I think we all know this is about the Winnipeg Jets finding their game, maybe catching a break or two to get a little bit of positive momentum and getting out of this funk that they've been in for a number of weeks that we've been talking about daily on the show. Yeah, I think when you look at the way they were playing and some of their other losses, um, was not good hockey. I mean, they didn't show up to play, but they were asleep to start the game. And it just was not, uh, you know, the way a playoff hockey team plays hockey. And the way they played the last two games um, was solid. I mean, the last game, you know, couldn't buy a goal. And I don't know if they're working on, like, putting the puck in the back of the net or finishing. Um, I'm not sure. But uh, they played well enough to win. They did not get the two points. Um, so we'll have to see how they look uh, in Florida. And I wonder if they have some you know, uh, motivation with Paul Maurice, or did they kind of already use that up when he was here? I don't know if we're going to have the same, you know, remember how how fired up Mark Shafley was in that one. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, yeah. what Are you ever going to be joining us on camera today? Um, or? I'm trying to figure this out. And <laughs> like, I keep restarting. You heard that sound is me like unplugging my camera and plugging it in. Um, like if you want to take a second, I can just reboot OBS. I don't know. This camera has been giving me a lot of problems and I forgot to, well, double, you're the CTO. You it. tell us, but uh, it is a little weird. Uh, do that. Well, you know what? While you do that, here. You know what? I got an idea. One sec. I'll I'll do a make idea. Little, I'm all uh, I'm all pissed off about this. But... Little little problem solving. Um, listen, yeah. a couple things to get to while Remo tries that. Well, um, 
So, go ahead. I was going to say, like, should I just re should we just re take a second here on YouTube and just reboot? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. a few minutes. YouTube listeners, give us a moment. Give we us need a moment. to be graced by Remus's presence. We're going to do a quick uh, little mm -hmm. reboot, I guess, is yeah, what they call it. I don't know the technical aspect okay. of it, but uh, that's what the CTO does. Just let me know when we're back. Yeah, you're back. All right, we're back. And I think we figured it out how to get Remo back in here. Thank you for your your patience, everybody. Um, while we uh, while we get Remo in here, I will let you know. Um, we are there. He is welcome. Oh, you got the Canada baseball. I got the Canada uh, too. World Baseball Classic season. I you know almost it's kind of been behind the radar, but it is going on. And I did need to rep. I got many of these Canada hats. I need to pull out. Yeah, well, the uh, better the hat than the jersey, as we talked about yesterday at the end of the program. It's terrible. What a weird, weird look. I don't know how the heck that happened. A little embarrassing for our Canadian team at the World Baseball Classic. But Don Callis is joining us a little later on today. And I know there's been plenty of people asking, are we going to have any more AEW tickets to give away? And we do have one final pair for the big event on Wednesday. And Remo, we're going to give people the weekend. Uh, and if you're listening to the podcast, you can enter. If you're with us on YouTube, you can enter. What you need to do is go over to the website at winnipegsportstalk.com slash contest and enter to win there. And we will announce the winner at the end of Monday's show. We've got some great seats, six rows up. For this uh, for this event, which I know a lot of you were fired up, but Remo and I certainly are. We're gonna have a nice crew there from Winnipeg Sports Talk for sure, and um, a one final pair of tickets to give away for AEW on Wednesday. So uh, um, relatively simple. Just make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and to the YouTube channel, and go over to the website and enter to win. And uh, we'll give you the weekend and basically up until Monday show to enter. Um, and Rima, why don't you explain? Because I think there is some ways you can get some extra entries. Yeah, so you just go to winnipegsportstalk.com slash contest. You can enter your email. You get bonus entries for signing up for our newsletter and uh, subscribing to our various social medias through the links there so if you're on the podcast yeah we're giving you a chance to winnipeg sports talk.com slash contest if you're on the youtube uh go go as well and that's the website and look or just go to winnipeg sports talk.com and then click the contest link at the top so there you go there you go and you got some extra ways to enter but uh, just make sure you're subscribed to the youtube channel and to the podcast t Cota Polly, how we enter we literally just told you Go to the website, click on contest. It's all there. We'll announce the winner for the Wednesday show at the end of Monday's episode of Winnipeg Sports Talk. A couple things we want to get to before Billet comes in, Reem. And again, we'll really focus in on the Jets with Scott and with Ken. Um, we have a firing to announce. Chuck Fletcher, gonzo, after four seasons with the Philadelphia Flyers and Listen, I can't say that I'm particularly surprised that the Flyers decided to move on in a different direction. Although the timing is a little interesting considering, you know, Chuck Fletcher was in charge of the trade deadline. Uh, what did and didn't happen, obviously a lot of criticism for maybe not moving a few more pieces uh, at the deadline considering where Philly is this year. Um, Danny Briere, former Flyer great, is going to take over as an interim general manager and you do wonder what that means for some other GMs that are on the hot seat. Pierre Lebrun, interestingly, is a piece just up at The Athletic asking who are the next NHL general managers on the hot seat after Chuck Fletcher got the ejector seat today. Kyle Dubas 
is at the top of the list. I think it's been pretty clear by everything that the Toronto Maple Leafs GM has done that it is all about getting out of the first round and regaining some confidence for you know from the fan base for a group that has been a great team through the regular season but just has not been able to get over that hump. Interestingly, that Brad Treleving is on this list. Ah, I mean, I thought that Brad Treleving did as good of a job as anybody in the league last year, considering the hand that he was dealt. Um, but uh, Pierre Lebrun reporting that for the second time in his tenure, Treleving is working on an expiring deal. So if the team does not make the playoffs, do they move on in a different direction? Pierre Dorian from the Senators is another one that you know that uh, LeBron cites, uh, and obviously there's a sale involved with the with the Senators, so maybe there's some other things behind the scenes. Listen, I think Senators are still definitely in a good place going forward, and I give Pierre Dorian a lot of credit for some of the moves that he's made. A lot of people love that Chikrin deal. See whether it's as popular, depending on what happens with their run to get one of those final wild cards, and of course not having their top pick in the draft this year. Uh, and then the other one is Ron Hextall from the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, he's only been on the job since February of 2021, agreed to a four-year deal. Um, but that was under a former ownership group. Um, one name not on that list, at least from Pierre Lebrun's perspective, is Jets general manager Kevin Sheveldayoff. And I know that uh, you know some people in chat will say, what the heck, he should be on the hottest seat. Others believe that, you know, Sheveldayoff will be the guy that will be in charge of what's going to be a rebuild, retool. I think fait accompli that there'll be some significant changes this year with this club. But um, Chuck Fletcher got the bullet today, Remo, and interesting those names that Pierre Lebrun mentioned today in The Athletic. Yeah, and for the Chuck Fletcher uh, of the Flyers, and he's been there for four years, and they really haven't improved at all, and a lot of the moves that he's made have been fails or a bit of a disaster with requiring Rasmus Ristolainen and with the Ryan Ellis, uh, Nolan Patrick swap. I mean, neither of them have really, have really played. Um, you know, what he gave away Eric Gustafson, who's was nice uh, acquisition there at the deadline for, for Toronto and who was pretty good in uh, Washington. And that was a trade with, Mont with Montreal. Um, and he just like hadn't, hadn't done anything to improve the team and they're kind of just been middling. And I, I don't know if Danny Briere is a long-term, I think he's an assistant GM. So um, we'll have to see what happens there. But I know Brandon Ruicki wasn't, uh, wasn't a fan of Chuck Fletcher. He did the Kevin Hay signing. I just thought when they didn't trade James Van Riemsdyk at the trade deadline, that was a big miss. If you have a UFA trade him, like eat whatever salary, what are you going to pay him? When you pay him to play? Tortorella, I mean, Tortorella gave a passionate defense of Chuck Fletcher and said he tried. But um, what do you mean? Just eat all the salary and get, take a pick for him. You can't do that. I, I mean, I, you don't. I, I think it, they would have been willing to do that. I really? Mean, no one know, wanted you need him? to have someone. I, apparently not. We'll they couldn't get Ken anything. We'll ask Ken about that. I did screw up the order today. I know Kenny usually joins us a little bit later. Yeah, he has uh, to be early. Good. It's going to be Billick first. I'm I think sure he's got a tea time. No, probably a baseball game. We'll get to that with Ken in just a minute. And then, yes, Don Callis a little bit later on. I'll have a little bit of fun talking about the big AEW event next year. Uh, next week, I should say, on Wednesday. Don't forget, go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Click on the contest link to enter to win that pair of tickets for AEW that we'll give away on Monday night. Um, all right, before we bring in Ken... Big shout out to the gang over at Manitoba Battery. Uh, if you're looking for a battery for your car, your truck, or that summer toy you're working on right now, Manitoba Battery is the place with the best prices in town. You'll be shopping local. You'll be saving time on gas and whatnot because they'll deliver it to you anywhere in the city. Same day if you order by 1.30. It's that simple. No more wasting your time in the Costco parking lot, waiting in line at Canadian Tire, or spending your money with the big box stores. You can shop local, get the best prices in town. And it was great to hear Jet Oil Tom, one of our regulars in chat, um, just pick one up from Donnie and the gang on uh, Wednesday and said, amazing service and uh, great price too. So it's that simple, gang. 783-8787. If you want to give them a call, you can order online at manitobabattery.com or 
pop down and see him in person at 1026 Logan Avenue. Well, I was joking about Ken hitting the golf course, but I do know he and Mike are going to hit some baseball games. That is the sound of spring that's hopefully just right around the corner. Consolidated Supply is ready for spring, working with golf courses throughout Manitoba. They are, of course, the club car dealer with all of your golf cart needs, but also the leaders in irrigation and artificial turf. So if you're thinking about a project on your property this year that has irrigation needs, talk to Joe and Spicy and the gang over at Consolidated Supply. Certainly, if you're looking at expanding that backyard or doing something cool, they've also got great hot tubs and spa options and amazing outdoor kitchens as well. They're also the leaders in small engine parts and small engine supply. Find out everything that they've got going on in person at 1395 Niaqua Road East, or you can check them out online at their brand new relaunched website at cte.ca. Big thanks to Consolidated Supply. Uh, we continue to welcome your nominations for the Wallace and Wallace Unsung Hero Program for our February Unsung Hero, along with Jet Star defenseman Josh Morrissey. Send us an email to unsunghero at winnipegsports.com. Tell us about that person in your community or in your life that deserves to be recognized as someone that's going above and beyond spending time out of their busy schedules to help others, whether it be extensive charity work, whether it be volunteering. We know how important volunteers are in all of minor sports. Um, the Unsung Hero is going to get an autographed jersey from Jets All-Star defenseman Josh Morrissey. And Wallace and Wallace will make a $500 donation to the Dream Factory in the name of the Winnipeg Sports Talk listener who nominated the Unsung Hero. And even better yet, Josh and Margot Morrissey are going to match that donation with another 500 for the Dream Factory, of which Josh is an ambassador. Again, Unsung Hero at WinnipegSportsTalk.com. Email your submission today. And just before we get Kenny on, if you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, and Manitoba's largest selection of local products too, you need to get on down to Vita Health Fresh Market. With spring just around the corner, get ready for it with Ultimate Male Energy, formulated specifically for men over 35. Ultimate Male Energy is designed to improve testosterone production, reduce excess body fat, build muscle tissue, maintain prostate health, and more. And it's on sale today at Vita Health, not to mention some great non-alcoholic options like craft beer mocktails and some great snacks for St. Patrick's Day. It's all there at Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge, and online at myvita.ca. To South Florida we go. And welcome in a storyteller, a connection creator, a contributor to sportsnet.ca, and the co-host of the Kenny and Rennie show. It's almost like I was just reading his Twitter bio. Ken Weeb joins us now. Follow him on Twitter, at Weeb's World. Golf, golf shirts on, short sleeves in effect, <laughs> beautiful background. Uh, things look good in Weeb's World right now. Andrew, great to be with you. Uh, Remo, Don Callis will be joining us later. Get that updated, my man. Uh, my old my old radio partner uh, hustles. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Cyrus, myself, and Joe used to have the old Sunday night sports show back in the day. So please do uh, give him my best when you when you have Don rolling uh, rolling into the program. We had some great. He was he was Rick Ralph before Rick Ralph was Rick Ralph uh, as my uh, as my as my heel, Andrew. You you'll appreciate that. <laughs> he. Uh... He's an absolute beauty. I mean, just Indeed. a hilarious dude. We've, uh, as I said, people are going to really enjoy this conversation a little bit later on. Uh, maybe as much as they're going to. Are you going to be back in time to be uh, there at the uh, the building on the 15th? Andrew, you know, we're, we're working behind the scenes here, but uh, so far I haven't had any uh, luck with the flight change. But I did have a bonus flight change on this leg of the road trip yesterday. So uh, maybe that's a sign of things to come. So I, I would love to see Cyrus in action. Uh, yeah, he is, uh, he's a good human being. We had a lot of uh, spirited debates back in the years. And uh, he even let me try to teach him a thing or two about hockey. And he definitely taught me uh, more than a thing or two about the wrestling business. So... Yeah, it's great to be with you, Huss. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, it's a bit of a zoo here. It is spring break in the United States of America. 
So that in Fort Lauderdale, that was uh, leading to a bit of a spirited scene uh, around the elbow room. I know uh, Gary Lawless, oh, uh, Gary Lawless, our, our, our pal, was uh, was on with Jeff Merrick earlier this week. So uh, I did not actually get into the elbow room yesterday, but I, I saw it from a comfortable distance. Uh, it was quite a uh, quite a scene. Uh, and uh, Andrew, there was quite a police presence down the main strip on A1A Beachfront Avenue uh, for all of the Vanilla Ice fans out there. Uh, it was uh, a lot of folks were enjoying themselves, Andrew, and I believe there were probably uh, more than one or two bad decisions that had uh, taken place by the time the uh, the night had. Uh, I was long gone by the time any of those things were happening, uh, Hus. But uh, it was it's been quite a scene around Florida here, that's for sure. I must say the uh, the trip to the elbow room this year must be a little different without the king of the elbow room himself, Indeed. one Dennis Bayak, not on the that's trip why I anymore. I couldn't even I couldn't even bring myself to go inside, Hus. So uh, <laughs> that that was uh, that was paying paying homage from the sidewalk. That was uh, that was all we had there. But yeah, it's been nice to uh, get out to Florida. It was interesting, Hus. Uh, pretty interesting practice a lot of energy i mean we know that there have been times where things have been quite tense around uh jets land here the intensity was pretty high but the joy level also high very spirited workout same lines as the other night i guess not a surprise given the fact that rick bonus thought it was their best game of the year one of their best efforts of the year uh no lineup changes that we will expect unless there's a curveball in the morning Pierre-Luc Dubois update on him is that he will not play in either game Saturday or Sunday. The hope Rick Bonus said was for him to meet the club in Carolina, but that's not a certainty right now. We'll have to see how that transpires, but definitely uh, high energy, high joy, high pace. And we'll see if that translates into what is a monstrous weekend for both of those teams. Huss. I mean, right tonight, the Panthers are playing the Blackhawks with a chance to pull within two points of that eighth and final playoff spot in the East. Uh, the Blackhawks will go on and play the Lightning on Saturday. So all these three teams are playing are going to be involved in a back-to-back -back scenario, uh, including you know the Panthers playing back-to-back -back against the Jets, then the Jets playing Tampa with both teams playing back-to-back -back after each of their opponents has played the Blackhawks. So uh, shaping up to be honestly, I, we overuse and overstate the importance of things quite regularly. Uh, Hus, it's part of the job title. But this is an absolutely critical weekend for the Winnipeg Jets. I went so far as to call it season-defining. I know some of my colleagues, including yourself, I think you agree, Huss, right? This, it, like, oh. The Jets can either you know, cement themselves or leave the door wide open because the Calgary Flames are playing tonight against the Anaheim Ducks. We've seen this week those are no guarantees in terms of points, but the door is already open for the teams trying to chase down the Jets and you know, the Arizona Coyotes did the Jets and their Jets nation a, a huge favor by beating the Nashville Predators. But I, the Jets can't rely on other teams. They're going to have to start relying on themselves during these final 17 games here. Well, exactly. And, um, you know, it was, it was three points left on the table. I mean, they should have had two against the San Jose Sharks. And, I mean, with the way that they played, you would think that, you know, in most cases they come out with a win against the Minnesota Wild. But right now... You know, in a lot of ways, it, it it is it speaks to the plight of the Jets over the past you know number of weeks. I mean, the state's back more, but we'll speak more in the recent history, Ken, of finding ways to lose hockey games. And I mean, listen, uh, you're not going to ever hear me hang anything on the Winnipeg Jets on Connor Hellebuck. He has been the guy that has been the backbone of all success this team's had over the last number of years. And but thanks man, for having my back, by the way. Thanks for having my back, Andrew. I know yeah. you uh, you set my partner in line. I think yesterday, I believe. Well, so it's good. Well, listen. I mean, Helly is 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 the guy for this team, and and that's why, you know, I said to uh, the guys that I was uh, sitting with at the game after that third goal went in, which was a terrible goal. Hellebuck never lets it in, and it was a real backbreaker at times for the Winnipeg Jets. To their credit, though, they did continue to push. And I really thought, Ken, that if they could get that win for Hellebuck under those circumstances, that he'd repay them on the road trip. Now, that didn't happen. All that being said, Hellebuck needs to step up. But there's a number of other players on this team that absolutely need to get going when it comes to lighting the lamp. And, you know, we can talk about the third line and we can talk about the lack of Pierre-Luc Dubois. Um, but... If not Kyle Connor, if not Mark Shifley, if not Nikolai Ehlers, those three players that are in the lineup right now can't get going and be a little bit more productive. 
Um, there are going to be some real, real tough um, conversations around this team. And I'll tell you what, uh, it's not going to be fun looking at the standings because you mentioned, I agree with you, this is season-defining in a lot of ways, what they can get out of these three games. Because while they're playing in Florida, in Tampa, and in Carolina against a team they've had no success against for a pretty long period of time, Anaheim, Ottawa, and the Arizona Coyotes are the next three up. I mean, it is not inconceivable that a week from today when the Jets play the Boston Bruins, they could actually be out of a playoff spot right now. So if the team, I thought that they played with some desperation and some urgency over these last couple of games, which has to be there right now. But if that doesn't continue, um, these conversations are going to get a lot tougher and their road to being part of the playoff tournament is going to be uphill. Yeah, no doubt, Huss. And, you know, for sure, Hellebuck is, you know, not playing at the Superman level we're used to seeing. that. That's obvious. So you can look at the numbers and that will tell you the tale. Uh, the Jets went from second in the NHL behind the Boston Bruins and goals against to 10th going into Friday's action. Like, that's a significant drop-off. Hellebuck's goals against average has risen, you know, I think 0.3 or 0.4. So he needs to be better. There's no doubt about that. And the team in front of him obviously needs to be better. Uh, I love the players that you mentioned, Huss. Obviously, Mark Scheifele had a good game, you know, several back. He's been their leading scorer. With Dubois out, Mark Scheifele needs to, you know, grab the game by the caller uh, at one point on this weekend and, and put his mark or stamp on it. Uh, Kyle Connor, I think he's starting to get a few more chances, Huss, but he just doesn't look like when Kyle Connor is scoring at an unconscious level, he makes everything look easy. Right now, it's not going as easily for Kyle Connor. Uh, he's a guy that, you know, sometimes you just get one and you might get five. That's the thing with him in terms of his goal scoring prowess. Right now, he's getting the looks. But those one-timers are sailing wide or that shot in front in the slot is getting blocked or it's going over top of the net. There just seems to be a little bit of hesitancy. And when there is a little bit of hesitancy, when it's not happening as easily, then guys start squeezing the stick. Even even guys who don't squeeze the stick normally. And that that's when you, know, you have the issues that the Jets are having when it comes to goal scoring. Quite frankly, I think their third line has actually played a lot better. I mean, Huss, I mean, both Barron and Lowry broke their droughts. And I thought Barron's doing an excellent job of getting to the net and using his body and starting to get his legs going. Uh, so to me, that line is starting to pick it up. I think Vladislav Nemestikov is starting to, you know, grow into his game. I think he's a good fit on that second line with Dubois not being available. Very versatile player. Nikolai Ehlers was up to 18 minutes. You know, obviously we talked about ice time last week. Uh, he was, I, I thought he was impactful in the game. So I, I think there are signs. And like you said, without James Reimer, you know, that game's not even close on Monday, but it didn't get them anything. So can you stick to the process after getting goalied and not revert to bad habits and start cheating for offense when goals have been tougher to come by? Now, I know the Jets had six against Jack Campbell and then a seventh and into the empty net, but, you know, Jack Campbell didn't play well that night. So, I mean, you got to take that for what it's worth. You don't diminish the end result, but that wasn't really their template either outside of the fact that they brought their intensity and battled. So they had much more of a template game the other night where, you know, they, they get it to overtime, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know. It's an interesting time. And that, that's a tough one for them because they gave up the late goal with 10.2 to go. Um, you know, the game against the Wild, I, it was vintage flurry. There's no other way to put it. I mean, 46 saves. He was ridiculous, battling, you know, lots of crazy bounces, pinball wizardry. He's just sticking the leg out. And uh, just like I said, that was vintage flurry. So the Jets generated plenty and gave up almost nothing. But Huss, they were the ones having the scheduling advantage. So those games with the scheduling advantage are games teams like the Jets have to take advantage of. And right now, they haven't done a good enough job on that front. But they have done a better job of rounding into the form that's required for them to have some sustained success here. Yeah. Um, you but know, the road the, is getting more difficult. Well, so. it, it is. And the time, I mean, that uh, that the sand in the hourglass is sort of, mm -hmm. you know, before it was all in their favor. I mean, you have the start that they had. I mean, where they were sitting and at one point in first in the Western Conference. That is, listen, I, I guess we'll have some more time for this a little bit later on. We'll yep. get back to the practice in the game. But I did want to ask you, 
Chuck Fletcher took a bullet today. He uh, was fired as the GM. And I see Pierre Lebrun uh, reporting in The Athletic. We were just talking about his piece about other GMs that, you know, now may be or feeling themselves on the hot seat. And the names are Kyle Dubas, Brad Treleving, Pierre Dorian, which surprised me a little bit, and Ron Hextall in Pittsburgh. Kevin Sheveldayoff's not on that list. Um, how, how significant changes do you think happen to this team if the Jets don't make the playoffs? And could that possibly include the GM, in your opinion? Or is that more would be down the road if things continue to go potentially through this offseason? I mean, is he going to be the steward for this guy in the offseason no matter what? It's a good question, Hassan. Only Mark Chipman really knows that answer for sure. But the biggest difference between Dubas, Treleving, and Kevin Sheveldayoff is that one member of that trio was <laughs> was given an extension, an, ex- an expansive expense. Uh, we believe it was a three-year extension. Uh, so those other two guys are on expiring contracts. So I do think that that is a big difference. That's not to say that uh, it's a guarantee and for Pierre job mentions sec- that Pierre mentions that in the thing. Right. It's not a guarantee for job security, named. but I mean, it, it is – it is a factor uh, to some degree, for sure. Uh, in terms of Pierre Dorian, I would say his is more related to the uns- unsettled ownership situation. Yeah. Us, right? That to me, I mean, if, if you're looking for someone who wanted to change, the, you know, we're talking about the Jets having some massive changes on the horizon. Well, Pierre Dorian has flipped the culture of the Ottawa Senators by bringing in pieces and then making some, you know, definitive moves. Uh, in terms of whether it was Claude Giroux in the offseason or now Jacob Chikrin at the deadline. So I think that when it comes to the, you know, being active in terms of making moves, I don't think Dorian is in any danger because of the moves he made. In fact, that will bolster his cause, but the uncertainty of the ownership situation, which with the closing of the the bids, the non-binding bids taking place this week, that could be more related to that. Uh, in terms of Sheffield Day Off-Huss, it's it, it's tough to know for sure. You know, the Jets... If they happen to collapse and miss the playoffs, does you know is the autopsy going to include an evaluation of the general manager? Of course it is. It has to. Uh, that was part of the equation last year as well. But uh, the Jets chose to stand with Sheveldayoff Dayoff then, and I would imagine that you know, in all likelihood they would stand to stick with them now. I mean, we've debated about the deadline, and you know we both agree we thought the Jets probably could have made a move on the back end to bolster the forward additions as well. I mean, he did go out and help their forward group, but did he help their team enough? I mean, that's still up for debate and will be determined over the last quarter of the year. But, you know, at some point, I mean, the Jets are going to decide if, if what direction, A, what direction they're going to go, and B, if Kevin Sheveldayoff is the person to implement that direction, Huss. And, and all that we have in terms of evidence so far through 12 years is that Kevin Sheveldayoff has the full support of Mark Chipman and the ownership group. So, until that changes, it, it it seems as though that's the direction that they're going. So it's an interesting time. I think it's a tense time. I would imagine that it has, you know, it's a tense time for Kevin Shevel day off because through 30 games, he was probably feeling pretty good about things. And now through 67 games, now things are getting to be a nervous time. Uh, you know, I'm sure some folks have watched. I mean, today was a, was a good chance to talk with Blake Wheeler. He is the most seasoned player on this team, even though he's not the captain, uh, his words still hold a lot of value. And, uh, you know, Blake said, great teams are forged through fire. So we know that the Jets have not handled adversity down the stretch all that well. And uh, and there are numerous examples, whether it's 2019 or 2021. So they have a chance to define what the season is going to end up like and what it's going to look like. And you know, today having Blake speak, I mean, we know Blake doesn't love to do media now that he's not the captain, and and that's well within his right. But I thought he had some interesting things to say, and I think it was important for him to speak. Now, ultimately, it's about action, but I think what he said made a lot of sense. I mean, he went back to saying that, you know, there have been more positive signs in the last couple of games, and we know that even though he's an intense person and can be a little bit direct and short with media at times, I mean, Blake still generally views his team through an optimistic lens, and he did that again today. And I think it was an important time. We've talked about leadership a lot this year, Huss. Uh, And I think Blake's voice still matters when it comes to leadership, and and he said all the right things today. Now, it's up to the Jets to back those words up with actions, but they, to me, at least look like they're in the right 
state to get ready for this weekend's games. And sorry, I didn't mean to, to veer. I just don't have a good answer for you, Huss. And like I said, only Mark Chipman knows that answer. And I know that some folks will be, you know, calling for changes if the Jets miss the playoffs. And especially given what's on the horizon. I mean, will they, I still, I don't think they're going to commit to a full rebuild and I don't see that happening. So if they're going to change it up on the fly, I just don't see the scenario being a parallel with the Flyers, Huss. I mean, they're one of the worst teams in the NHL this year. So I, I know that there are some parallels between Chuck Fletcher and Kevin Cheveldayoff. And now Chuck Fletcher has been fired twice during Cheveldayoff's tenure. I just don't know that I would equate them as as you know, I, there are some similarities. I don't see them as direct parallels. Here's the thing, and I'm not lobbying on either side of it. I'm just kind of speaking to you know what's at stake. I think sure. for the entire thing, because let's face it, if the Winnipeg Jets blow this and miss the playoffs, we'll be able to look back and just by the numbers for the last half of the season. Game if that 31, happens, man. started game 31. Th- th- they'll they'll be one of the worst teams in the National Hockey League. I mean, even right now. When you look at the records from January 1st to where we are right now, it's ugly. Uh, and Sub it's a 500. Damn, it's a damn 31. good thing that they got the points and did what they did earlier on so that they still can salvage this right now. Um, but I do wonder, I mean, what sort of a, uh, what sort of an autopsy it happens if we do get to that point? Because I think regardless of what happens, we're going to see some major changes when it comes to some of the personnel. And... Um, and as I said, I mean, retool, reload, however you want to define those things, I think big changes are coming. And a part of that is going to be outside of their hands. Depends on, you know, players' willingness to stick around and sign extensions. Yep. And I'm telling you, I don't think that job gets any easier if this season ends the way that it has been trending right now, which brings us all back to – sorry, go ahead. Just one quick one. I mean, Huss, I mean, how big a factor is Barry Trotz taking over in Nashville? I mean, this was a person that the Jets were looking at bringing into the organization, and the thought was that Barry eventually wanted to slide into the GM role. So a potential successor is already off the board had the Jets ever gotten to that point. And again, I'm not saying that they were at that point, but they certainly had him involved in the coaching discussion. And if he was going to be accepting, we knew that that other – you know, piece of the puzzle or domino was potentially going to fall eventually, whether that meant Kevin Cheveldayoff moving into more of a president role or hockey ops uh, rather than being strictly the general manager, you know, remains to be seen. And uh, that's, sorry, where I will say, Hus, there is a parallel, is that the Flyers are hiring or are said to be hiring both a president and, you know, of, of hockey ops plus a general manager. So, I mean, at some point, if we're looking at the discussion for the Jets, maybe that's something they consider adding, you know, if you're not going to replace the general manager, what if you add a voice into that, you know, into the hierarchy, uh, you know, and even if, it, even if it means more on the business side, the way that Brian Burke handles things in, in Pittsburgh, because I know you mentioned Ron Hextall. So uh, that would be something for me to keep an eye or for people to keep an eye on. It's been something that I've been curious about for, you know, a number of years, but, you know, we know that whether that's related to, you know, revenues or whatever else I, I don't know but I'd be curious if that would be something the Jets would consider at some point like we saw in Vancouver well, how big the expansion was with a bunch of AGMs being brought in I wonder if if the Jets at some point consider having a president added to the mix or maybe another assistant general manager to go with Craig Heisinger and Larry Simmons would be the other would be the other part of that equation well, well I mean listen I mean if you accept I mean that there's a crisis with the team right now on the ice I mean I don't think it's going too far to say that they're bordering on crisis on the business side as well right now I mean empty seats challenges selling sponsorships all of those things are part of where they are at right now and I think there's certainly an argument to be made that another voice another person in there that could help on both sides would be beneficial to the team those people also are very expensive. <laughs> and uh, that's fair. You know what? If you're in a situation where your bottom line is going backwards, I'm, and again, it's not my money. I'm not making the decisions. I have no idea how bad it is. I just know the way it looks and I know how different it has been from being that arena this season as to other seasons. And I think that creates a whole nother level of issues and at the same time it may force their hand a little bit on doing things that they hadn't done it's interesting that you bring up the nashville predators ken because nashville always seemed to be that model franchise that the winnipeg jets and true north sort of thought that they would be patterning themselves afterwards david Poyle, gm for what 26 years or something like that till he basically 
stepped down and now Barry Trotz is taking over. And certainly, I think, as we've seen how long Paul Maurice was the guy here for, they had thought that, you know, a lot like the Pittsburgh Steelers, get a guy, believe in that guy, and that is your guy going forward. And, yep. you know, you're not making these quick decisions. It's very rare in pro sports, especially in the NHL, to go that road. But I do think that that was the vision of the people at the head of True North when they were putting this team together. And that's great if you're winning and you maintain being competitive. It certainly does test those plans when you have seasons like they've had in the past. And honestly, uh, I mean, again, and I don't want to get too much into what ifs, but there are a lot of what ifs on this team. And to be honest, I think Ken bringing us back to this weekend and your proclamation of a season defining road trip, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think the time is now for the guys that are wearing those jerseys to step up and a few wins can change a lot very quickly. But man, they've been tough to come by right now and it's not going to happen if they don't get better performances from a number of players, but especially the guys that frankly are getting the biggest checks. Yeah, the stars are going to need to show up here, and that's not to say that the you know the guys with the lunch buckets and work boots are not required because they will be required in these two games. Because what we also know, Hus, is that Tampa Bay Lightning just went through a bit of a rough patch as well. So uh, we know that they're going to be hungry. They won their game the other night, so they're going to be bad. They're going to be. They've gone through their you know their hiccup or whatever you want to call it. So. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting time, Huss. I mean, continuity is is an important thing in any organization. The Bombers have shown that, and I mean, we we you and I have discussed this plenty. I mean, the Bombers were close to fuck. You know, they were under consent. Mike O'Shea's future was not a guarantee at one point. They stuck with him, and then they powered through. And and though that choice obviously was the right one, and has led to a couple a lot of silverware being uh, distributed. So for the Jets, I mean, they need to get things turned around whether you know this weekend would be a a smart time to get things tilted considering the fact they're staring at the boston bruins coming off this three-game road trip you know they don't have a you know cookie cutter schedule down the stretch there are a couple games that that would appear to be a little bit of the lighter lighter variety than the heavyweight variety but those have been no guarantees either this year for the jets or anyone else so they can only take care of what's ahead of them they need to be urgent they need to be hungry and they need to leave make sure they're not leaving this to chance because for them, they can't be reliant on that last week of other teams beating Calgary or Nashville. They need to take care of their own business. That's why I said what what I saw today was something that I would call a positive. There have been plenty of times where the Jets have been way too uptight and tense and nervous on the ice in recent times, and it has led to some, you know, the impact and some of the results and efforts. But to me, they seem like a group that was pretty hungry. They, they had themselves a team meal last night, a bit of a bonding opportunity for guys like Nino Niederreiter and Vladislav Nemesnikov, newcomers to the program. So how they handle themselves this weekend is absolutely massive, and we're not overstating this. I mean, uh, it's not must-win territory, but they definitely need to be sharp and playing well and to get some results. I mean, th- it that's the most important thing at this time of year, but they have 17 games to essentially define what their season is going to be. Will it be remembered for the 29-1 and one start, or will it be remembered for the collapse in the final 62? I mean, it, it, it basically, if we want to boil it down, us, it doesn't get any more simple than that. You either get defined by your first 30 games, you can work yourself through it at the end, or you'll be looking at a 62-game block for a team that underachieved the year before and hasn't had a lot of playoff success since 2018. So I think, like I said, I do think that they're better equipped to handle this situation, and I know the timing wasn't very good because the last time I said that, they went out and got smoked the next night. But I do think that they have the pieces and the ability to pull themselves out of this, but ultimately those words mean nothing. They have to be answered with actions and if they aren't answered with actions then us to your point earlier i think now you accelerate the process of of churning over the roster because it would be hard to look in the mirror and say you know what we said last summer it was only coaching and the results were eerily similar so at some point there's going to have to be changes to the core group and now it's up to the core group to show why there don't need to be as many changes as are all probably already required. Yeah, uh, Ken Weaves with us down in South Florida. Jets at Panthers tomorrow night at Lightning on Sunday before heading to Carolina to finish up the three-gamer on Tuesday. Um, Kenny, quickly back to practice for a minute. You mentioned it seemed upbeat. It seemed like there was a lot of energy. Um, 
Did they work on the power play at all? They Phyllis did, yes. didn't, they, they, they did. Uh, any differences in personnel right now? Um, because the one thing I'll say, I mean, listen, Hellebuck need to be better last game, sure. The power play has been killing this team. Um, and, and you know, getting one goal here and there from taking advantage of your of your man advantages directly correlates to winning games in the standings right now. And as good as the penalty kill has been, it really seems like at times, even when they're playing very well five on five, a bad power play where they can't even get set up can take a lot of life out of the building and suck the momentum out of a team that was playing well at five on five. Yeah, for sure. So they, they're still sticking with the five men uh, that were on the top unit. That's Blake Wheeler now with Dubois being out. They did experiment a little bit. There was a little bit more motion, obviously, and there were other situations where Blake was on the right wing half wall, like the old spot for him where he was the one doing the feeding across. Uh, there were times in, when Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley flip-flopped wings, but they tried that the other, you know, the other day in practice. It didn't happen when the game actually got going, but... They were scoring with a higher rate for sure. I know Scotty's about to come in. They, they definitely looked better than the other practice where they had really nothing cooking uh, whatsoever and the penalty killers were having all the fun. But ultimately, again, it comes down to getting it done when the whistles are between the whistles. And that's something that, you know, the Jets movement, and it was much crisper today. Rick Bonus pointed it out in his media availability. But ultimately, that's got to transpire and translate into game action. Now it is true that you know sometimes teams can win without having a successful power play. I think the Boston Bruins in 2011 were one of the teams that, that weren't exactly operating on all cylinders. But for this team right now, when they're having trouble scoring goals at five on five, they need their special teams to continue to give them a lift. The penalty kill has taken care of that part of the responsibility. The power play needs to follow suit if the Jets are going to make life a little bit easier on themselves and the, and the people between the pipes. Uh, I fully expect a bounce back performance from Hellebuck considering what happened on uh, Wednesday against the Minnesota Wild. If he does play well, uh, does he go again on Sunday, do you think? Huss, it's a great question. We know it's limited travel between Tampa and Sunrise. It, to me, it depends on shot volume. I mean, the Panthers are a high shot volume team, but they are playing on the back end of a back to back. So it could depend on workload. But I mean, Rick Bonus kind of showed his cards earlier in the week. He said the reason, part of the reason he had to play in the game, uh, you know, on the Sunday was because he needed to get him in on the back-to-back -back this weekend, right? So, or sorry, that was the, uh, yeah, sorry, that other game. Never like mind. The, the, the Saturday the against, the, uh, against the Oilers? Yeah, I mean, he was, sorry, it was oh, the Monday game. that. When he was playing, the he was he, he needed to play in the, uh, yeah, yeah. Like he he uh, went both he went both games, but obviously Friday well, didn't go relief, well. He didn't right? play so, the third period. He didn't play the third period. And then they started him again. On Sunday, no, no, yeah, yeah. Saturday, Sorry, against I meant the, the game against uh, San Jose. The reason why he played yeah. him against the Sharks is because he thought he would need him on the weekend, uh, because of the back-to-back. -back. Now, you know, if if Calgary wins tonight and the Jets play well tomorrow, and Hellebuck has a you know tidy 24, 25 shot effort, could he start? Yes, but there aren't a lot of. If windows. I'm Rick Bonus, if I'm Rick Bonus right now, and just seeing what's happened with this club and the, I mean, how yeah, many I mean, few games there are it's left on the I table, mean, Huss. I guess I'd have a be tough on the time. Table. I'd have a tough time not putting Hellebuck out there because even if he'd played the night before, it's hard to make the argument that anytime he's in the net, Wednesday night notwithstanding, that he doesn't give you a better chance to win. No, and that's totally fair. And I would also say that the fact that you know David Riddick has had probably one bad goal in each of the last three starts would also factor into the decision. Now you run the fine line of saying at what point do you run your number one guy into the ground by playing him too much. But us, I think right now they've reached critical territory and they need to, you know, the, and that's part of the reason why he didn't play Monday. It's to give him a five day block where he didn't play. Right. So I would say that he is much more likely to play in both games on the weekend than he would have been, you know, a week or 10 days ago. But it ultimately will depend on the effort of the guys in front of him and also how he feels afterward. But I, I don't think that Connor Hellebuck is run down. I don't think he's played too much. Uh, he's played a lot, but he can handle he's playing a lot. He's done it for his entire career. And in fact, he enjoys the rhythm element of it. So I would say the door is open, but I mean, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be wouldn't be taking a large wager over to the good folks at Coolbet, uh, Huss. But uh, I would say it's certainly on the table and it will depend on the workload and volume. What uh, what's the uh, what's the ball game tonight? Yeah, we got the uh, red today for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals hosting the New York Mets tonight at Roger Dean Stadium. A rare uh, Grapefruit League night night action uh, should be a fun little tilt over in Jupiter. Haven't been down to that park, so thought we would check it out. 
Uh, it's a fun weekend on the horizon. Going to get to see the Jays at least once and possibly twice. So it's a uh, well, good. Send a picture uh, out on your Twitter feed. Make all of us jealous. You got out just in time for Environment Canada to drop a special weather statement for the weekend. I apologize so, for uh, that. That was uh, that's a veteran move by you, Ken. You you know what you're doing. Hey, thanks a lot for this. This has been awesome as always. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back in the peg and on the show next week. And hopefully, if you can get here early enough. <laughs> to see Don Callis and the AEW fellas do their thing on Wednesday night at the rink. Yeah, man, have an awesome weekend. Great to be with you. And uh, yes, please send my best to uh, Cyrus. Tell me, tell me, he hasn't, uh, he still has my phone number as, as the saying goes. <laughs> Thanks so Take much. Easy, man. Thanks. Weeb, at Weeb's World on Twitter. And of course, uh, you can read all of Ken's reporting from the road at sportsnet.ca. Uh, Got to give a huge shout out. Speaking of baseball, baseball season is back. World Baseball Classic going on right now, and the Jays are just about to get going. For you Jays fans that need the newest gear, you know where to get at Royal Sports. While you're there, you can check out uh, thousands of pieces of Winnipeg Jets merchandise, tons of Winnipeg Blue Bomber gear, and of course, the best of the NBA, National Football League, uh, and international soccer as well. Tons of stock for snowboards, boots, and bindings ahead of spring break. And uh, I know a lot of you people still playing lots of hockey right now as the season winds down. Amazing deals right now in the hockey department, including some Warrior sticks up to 50% off. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. Follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. Speaking of uh, spring and summer, fellas, is your wardrobe ready for the turn of the seasons? Got weddings, parties, many things that you'll need to uh, at times get dressed up for. And no better place to get your gear suited up than F Apparel Downtown. Custom suits for men beginning at just 400 bucks, Far more than just suits, chinos, golf pants, Custom shirts, both tucked and untucked, and the best selection of men's accessories are around. Whatever you need, F Apparel's there for you. Make an appointment or find out more at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. Make sure to ask if you're in a wedding party about a 15% discount for the entire wedding party when you get your fits from F Apparel. If you've got a 2023 grad in the family, get the young man a new suit for the next chapter of his life, and F will hook him up with a free custom shirt and tie valued at $150. F Apparel, fapparel.com and 190 Smith Street downtown. And a big shout out to our friends at Boston Pizza. Maybe a little scoreboard watching tonight down at the local BP. Um, it's winter, It's always uh, a win situation when you're having some ice cold schooners, gourmet pizzas, Boston wings and more. I actually tried last night the chicken parm ravioli. Part of the new uh, new feature menu over at BP it was really great. But again, you can't go wrong with wings and cactus cuts, which has been on my training table for years. Uh, Boston Pizza, you can also order citywide as well as many communities in Manitoba online at bostonpizza.com. All right, Don Callis, a little bit later on. Don't forget, if you want to win tickets to AEW, if you joined us a little later on, we've got one more pair we're going to be giving them away through a contest on the website, winnipegsportstalk.com slash uh, contest for all of that. Well, let's get Billick in here from the Winnipeg Sun to continue the Jets conversation as we head into the weekend. Scotty, what's going on? How are you? It's going, Huss. I almost broke a control. So all the fans or the listeners that watch uh, that like me to talk about playing video games, I, I, I just nearly broke a, a control. I almost swore there. I just nearly broke the controller playing Call of Duty, so I'm fired up. I'm fired up for the show. Still, I put my elbow through it. Still like banging like, out the COD, to... huh? Well, Always. I've um, <laughs> I'm still more doing FIFA and NHL, my personal favorites, and uh, a little bit of Madden as well. But um, yeah. I would I, I would be more commentating on your COD. I would be killed within five seconds, and it would be <laughs> it would be all over. Um, Scotty, let's get to the Jets. Yeah. The overtime loss was a killer. I mean, the late goal against San Jose. But, I mean, I think that overall played a pretty strong game. James Reimer was great. Yep. Uh, and then, I mean, Rick Bonus said it afterwards. Loved the way that his team played. I think that probably come does not include his power play. Um, and, obviously, Connor Hellebuck had a very uncharacteristic off night, and they lose in regulation. Um, yep. They've lost a lot of games over the last little while. 
But specifically this week, what's your read on where the team is at considering the way they played, not getting the results, going on to a road trip where they'll have to play as well, if not far better, and continue and maybe get a little bit of puck luck as well? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like, I, I don't think this team wilted this week, right? Like, I mean, you know, you, you watch those two games, and, I'm, you know, I, I'm sure they were frustrated against San Jose. I mean, look at Morgan Barron gets robbed twice, once on the breakaway, once on a one-timer from, you know, right on the doorstep. Like, I mean, those are those, – those can be really deflating for a team and for a player when, you know, you're going through the rut that they are. And then you look at, you know, the, the, the last game against Minnesota. And, I mean, they – they played Minnesota how they should have played Minnesota, given the way that Minnesota played the night before. Um, you know, they lost that game, but that was a really heavy. You know, it, it, that was a, that was a rough game for for both teams, Minnesota and Calgary. So coming in here, you kind of expected the Jets, and and so I mean that's a good sign. Like the Jets, the Jets didn't play to the level of their opponent that night. They really brought it to Minnesota, um, and they didn't wilt when they were still trying to get the goal right. But it just like it's just not enough right now. Right. Like, I mean, like I get it. Like you can have these games, 20, 30 games into the season, but now when you've got 17 games left and you're losing and you've lost nine, your last 11, seven, your last eight, however you want to look at it. And you're falling down the central division standings or the Western conference standings. And you got Calgary hot on your heels and yeah, you know, Arizona did the Jets a solid last night by, by beating Nashville predators who, you know, kind of at that point controlled their own destiny. Um, but you know, it, it's just not the time we, we've heard this team talk about ramping up and ramping up to the playoffs. Like, I, I feel like we've been, I remember, I think it was like after game, you know, 45, Nate Schmidt came out after a tough loss and he's like, okay, we got to start ramping up, focusing. And then, you know, we've heard this at the 30 game mark and the 25 game mark and the 20 game mark. And now we're at the 17 game mark and we're, we're hearing the same things, but we're not seeing any you know, results, right? And this is, you know, this is the time where you can say all these great things, but if you're not winning, if you're not getting the results, it's going to go wrong for you. And, and, and so, yeah, like, I mean, the Jets are taking steps forward in their game lately, but I, I just really have a tough time with that. Like it, it, you're, you're taking steps forward, but you're not winning and now you're not winning. And, and now you got to go on this road trip where it could be a murderous row. And then you got to come back home and you got to play the Boston Bruins. And then that's, <laughs> That's no easy feat. As we've seen the Bruins have lost what eight times total this year, something like that. Like, you know, it, it's it, it's a really bad time to be trying to like find your game, trust the process, all that, because you know the time's running out, and and we haven't seen a, a consistent game from the Jets. I mean, Rick Bonus says that might be the best game they've played all year um, the other night, but. When was the last time you said that? I could say that about this team. It'd probably been 20, 25 games since you, you you could say that they played their best game all year. And they played their best game all year against a really tired Minnesota Wild team. So it, I don't know. I, I don't know where this team is at. I, I struggle to have confidence in them right now because of the way that they're playing and because they just they don't play uh, any sort of good, consistent game. I think, you know, they, they're, they're so inconsistent. And you know, and if Connor Hellbuck has a bad night as he did the other night, I mean that that so that that can be the difference, right? And it's often the difference with this team is that yeah, I mean goaltending in Hellbuck general. Is, if you if you have a, I right. mean, it, it like, that honestly but, it didn't matter who was in net. If your goalie, right. um, you know, has as off a night as Connor did, um, you're probably not winning. And uh, that's a tough pill to swallow, especially considering the situation this team is in. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt that Hellebuck bounces back from that. I think he'll be yeah. better on this road trip. Um, but again, there's a lot of things that have to come together for this team to get back in the win column, considering the path that they've got in front of him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Ken described this as a season-defining road trip. Are are, are you there uh, w- w- with Ken on the uh, on the thoughts of what is at stake for the Winnipeg Jets? Like, I'm not saying if they don't get the wins, they're done, because they do have a four-point lead on Calgary. Yeah. But there's a possibility that next week we could be talking about them being the chaser if they don't get some results right now. And I have no doubt that that level of urgency is certainly felt in the room. And I think we saw it on the ice, which gives me some hope going forward. But again, we're moving up a couple weight classes, uh, moving on to the onto the road, considering the teams that are in the Winnipeg Jets' way once they start tomorrow night. 
Well, yeah, at least two of the three teams really, you know, kind of beefed up before, uh, the dread down, right? Like, the, you know, just try and whatever, whether it was Tanner Janot and in um, in Tampa, you know, Carolina beefed up. Obviously, the Panthers weren't, you know, a huge player in, in, in that, given that their position sort of. But the Panthers are a desperate team and a real dogfight in the Eastern Conference, right? And so that's, you know, that's another type of team. So, it's a, you know, you're playing some different types of teams here, ones that are really ramping up to the playoffs, like Carolina. Tampa's had some struggles of late. But, you know, I think they're going to be a team that's also looking to kind of make their mark and, and, and not, you know, end their streak. Or in their you know rough patch and and then obviously, yeah you know what we said about Florida it, it, uh, season defining yeah I mean you know I, I'm I'm almost there if if not there because you know it doesn't get much easier once the you know the Jets get home uh, from the from the road trip I mean you know if if they were to go for three you know that would be that would be bad because then you know you come home Boston you know, might lose that you might you know you might stretch this losing streak to. You know, while well, right now would be that would be six games, and at that point, you're right. I mean, next week, next Thursday, um, could be a game where you know you're trying to hold on to the wild card spot, depending on what Calgary does. Calgary, I believe, has a favorable um, schedule going on right now. Oh, I think they Nashville got the Ducks. Too. They got yeah, the tonight. Ducks, the Sens, and Coyotes yeah. in their next three. Before, exactly. Like, so, I mean, the, the, the Ottawa, Ottawa has been a hasn't has been a tough out this year. Um, Arizona can win games for whatever reason. I don't understand why they're even trying to win games at this point, but they are. They, um, they, they win at home all the time. I, mean, I know. The, it's so strange. And they did it again it's, last night. I, I put a little sprinkle on them. They're always a home underdog, but, like this, and they're 16-2. and two. That being said, they've won seven on the road all year. Good thing for Jet fans is <laughs> that game is at least in Arizona, although we saw Calgary go into Arizona about a week and a half ago and put up almost 60 shots and completely dominate yeah. that hockey team. So... They can't yeah. count on anything no. from the teams helping no. them out right now. They have to count on themselves, right? I mean, and that's the thing. Like, this is what the Jets haven't been able to do over the last little while is count on themselves. Connor Hellbuck has a bad game. This team can't win a game for them. If, if they have a bad game, you know, it, it, they're, they're looking for the goalies to stop all but maybe two shots. But even then, the Jets have scored only two goals or fewer in a bunch of those losses where it's like, you don't even give yourself a chance to win or your goalie to take it because, you know, two goals in this league doesn't really win you a lot of games. And, and that's not the way that the Jets, you know, the Jets have operated a lot this season. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like, it, 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 it's so it, – it's such a strange kind of fall from grace. I don't know what you want to call it. it, it it's it, it's so weird that you get a lot of your best players back from all your injuries and then the team just kind of returns to – you know, almost like last season's, you know, type of hockey. Um, you know, some of the issues that you've seen uh, haven't really been. You, you, you have watched this team be challenged time and time again by their head coach, and they haven't really risen to that all that often. The power play, I mean, you, you look at it and you're like, yeah, you have all this talent on the power play, but, you know, you look at it and it's just like it's so stagnant that, like, of course nobody scores. I mean, it's not hard. I mean, they pass to Josh. Josh gives it to, you know, Kyle or Mark on the other side. Like, nobody really moves. And, you know, you hear Rick Bonus talk about it today after practice. I mean, you know, they're whipping around, snapping around in practice, no problem. And, and we've seen that. But there was a time last week that the Jets couldn't score on their own, on their power play in practice against their own penalty kill. And, and their own penalty kill is good. But you talk about Rick Bonus after, and he's like, well, you know, they're not really trying to, like, you know, drill shots and stuff like that. I don't know. That might be true. I watched Nate Schmidt, you know, put a howitzer off the face of uh, uh, David Riddich on that power play. I mean, I think they are trying to score on that on, in practice, but you know, in in game situations, it just hasn't translated. So as much as they can, you know, whip it around in practice and you know have all these good feelings in practice, when it gets to the ice, it doesn't translate. It's an, it's a very well, and, interesting and you know what, and so much thing. of this, so much of this ends up yeah. going to those top players. And I mean, sure. I'll sort of remove Nikolai Ehlers a little bit from this because he has spent so little time on that number one power play, and yeah. that continues to confound me. I mean, it would be yeah. one thing to keep <laughs> things going if they were consistently scoring, um, yeah. but they haven't been, and that would seem to be one of those things that you'd maybe want to go back to and try when things have not been, uh, have not been working out. Um, but I mean, we just talked to Ken he said it was the same personnel there. Yeah. They were doing a couple different things. Wheeler apparently was on the half wall there. Um, so I do wonder about that, but to me, I, I mean, so much of this, I think boils down to 
Mark Shifley, Nikolai Ehlers, and Kyle Connor. And I want to ask you specifically about Connor because he has been ice cold for his standards over the last little while. Yeah. You know, we heard him talk after the last game and he was asked about the power play and was basically at a loss for words. I mean, yeah. there wasn't really much you could say. Um, the Jets are going to have a tough time winning hockey games if these guys don't get going and start feeling a little bit more and getting some success. But specifically about Connor, is this just a guy that's having terrible luck right now? Or is he off the game that um, set the bar so high last year with that 47-goal season when the rest of his team wasn't playing the way this team did for a good portion of this year? Yeah, I mean, he led the team the other night with six shots on goal, so it's not like he's not shooting, right? I mean, he's getting um, pucks. I think Adam Lowry, I think he was tied with Adam Lowry, six shots on goal. But um, either way, I mean, he, he, he he's still been getting his shots, right? Um, but, you know, I remember in that game, I, I want to say it was, yeah, I want to say it was the last game where, you know, they're going in on a three-on-one, and Kyle Connor has, you know, quite a bit of uh, shooting uh, talent. And, you know, he tries to pass it off, and, and, you know, they end up not getting a shot. And we've seen this time and time again this year where this team has been on a 2 on 0 at one point and, and failed to get a shot off. Um, I, it, I wonder if it's a bit in his head. Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, I wonder if it, it, the, the snake, the snake bite has has really seeped in and crept into his game. It, it's been a struggle for him. Um, I think you, you're seeing it at times, you know, especially for Connor. Like I, I've watched him, you know, really try and you know, not that he doesn't try and take it into the zone and do that, but I think he's been trying harder to you know dangle through a couple defensemen and get something going, like. If there's one guy really kind of gripping their stick harder than the rest of them, it, I think it's Kyle Connor. I think it, it's gotten to him. He's relied upon on this team to to score, to score a lot, to score on the power play. I mean, that's been a, his bread and butter at times, um, and and it just hasn't been there for him. And um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you say that because you know it, this isn't the first time somebody's sort of just kind of almost shrugged their shoulders at the power play this year. You know, I'm un- unsure of kind of how to fix it. and Well, and to me, the I power mean, play yeah. earlier on, I can remember, and I mentioned this a couple times in recent well, shows. Yeah. Uh, exactly. It I moved. mean, the puck movement was quicker, but the players were moving around as well. And, yeah. you know, when this team is really struggling, What's they're the relatively pocket? easy to defend against. I mean, yeah. they're basically standing in their spots. They're moving the puck around, mostly to the perimeter. At times, they're having a tough time even getting control or getting into the zone. Yeah. That's something that Ehlers helps immediately if he's on your group. And um, I'll be, I mean, listen, bottom line is they need to figure it out. They need to get more from that unit. Um, And I am a little surprised that they maybe haven't tweaked the personnel a little bit, at least over these last couple of weeks where things haven't been going um, the way that they have. Um, Defense-wise, from the looks of practice, it might be Stanley staying in actually for the next game. And yeah. to be honest, he had a big goal. He did play <laughs> yeah. quite well in that game. Um, but I wanted to ask you, how did you see the incident with Kaprizov? Um, because it was weird. Like after the game or even during the game, I didn't really notice anything from the wild that suggested that they were, you know, irate about it or uh, no. felt that, that it was a dirty play. Um, and again, fans are very different than players. Fans, of course, we're upset. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there is basically wanted signs throughout the state of hockey right now, and the amount of people that are circling April 11th, which is the 81st game of the season for the Jets in Minnesota against the Wild, as a retribution game. Uh, was that just a weird, fluky play? Yeah, yeah, it was. Right? I mean, it was. It happened right in front of us, uh, up in the press box, and you're kind of looking at it, and you're like. Okay, I don't think that was dirty, but it just became really awkward. Like, it's almost like Stanley didn't even, I don't know if he didn't see Kaprizov. I don't want to say that because he, he probably did, but just the way that, it, it, it's not the way that you would normally hit a guy. And then Kaprizov kind of crumbles and Stanley, I mean, he's big. And so, you know, he's kind of moving around. It looks a little awkward and it looks like he almost tackles him, but. And he does, I guess, in a certain sense, but it, I, I didn't think there was any malice on it. And I don't think anybody from the wild suggested that either. Like, it, I mean, even when you look back at it, you know, I was looking at Mike Russo's uh, from The Athletic is just trying to see, like, you know, what, what has anybody seen? And, and, and I, 
I don't think anybody viewed that as a as a dirty hit, and obviously the league didn't see any reason to, you know, uh, issue any supplement. But I mean, the, the problem is that that Kaprizov, one of their best player or if their best player, is injured and and he's out for three four weeks, which basically puts him out for the reg- rest of the regular season. And the Minnesota Wild are wild. They're in, in a fight. They're trying to, you know, stay in, in, in second in the central. They're trying to, you know, maybe even chase the Dallas Stars down, all that sort of thing, hold off the Colorado Avalanche, the Jets. Um, if they can get it going, um, that's a big blow. I mean, that's the guy that scores a lot of their goals. And so, yeah, I understand that the fan base is wanting Ryan Reeves to probably go out there and, and tune Stanley in um, on the second last, you know, the penultimate game of the season. But, it, it's just one of those plays in hockey that sometimes, you know, crap happens, right? And, and I, I think everybody, that anybody I watched, you know, after the game, you just, you kind of watch, you know, some of the, when the injury news came out, you're, you know, listening to the guys on TSN or sports now, was listening to Elliot about it, um, talk about it. And, and you're just like, you know, nothing really seemed, he saw, they, all these people kind of saw it the same way that, that we did. It was just, it was an awkward co- kind of collision and Stanley ended up on Kaprizov, and Kaprizov's legs are, you know, mangled and almost doing the splits underneath him, and his knee kind of gets, you know, jarred or whatever it is. And, yeah, I, I don't know how to explain it much better than it was just a kind of a fluke or a freak accident. Um, you know, I don't even know how Stanley – like, if, if Stanley was going to hurt him, he would have just drilled him in the head. And, like, I mean, I don't – you know, based on that kind of hit, I, that's not what yeah. happened. It was just – it was – it was just a, it was an accident. You know, yeah. it's just a thing that happens on the ice every now and then. And and but yeah, I get it. Fans are upset. It won't be the last and... we hear of it, though. No, and no, I mean, no, who no, knows whether coming. Stanley's know. yeah. who knows whether Stanley's even in the lineup at that point for the Winnipeg Jets and what this situation is. Um, because listen, at, at at the rate that this is going, no matter what, that's going to be a huge, yeah, huge yeah. game. I mean, it's hard to imagine based on the schedule for the less little bit that this doesn't come down to those games in April Mm -hmm. with the playoffs on the line. And in a lot of ways, the playoffs are on right now for the Winnipeg Jets with 17 games left. Do you think, I mean, we've talked about the situation the team is in. Everyone knows where they're at, especially the guys in that room. Do you think there's any boost to the club for tomorrow night's game because of who they're playing against and who's on the bench? I mean, I, I would suggest that you need to be a desperate and urgent team and play like your season is on the line regardless. But um, is there anything more to it with the guys in that room? There might be with fans, but does it matter to the players? Oh, I think for some it does, yeah. I, I think, again, I stand by this. I've heard about it. There was a lot of guys very hurt by what happened last year. Um, caught off guard, weren't expecting it, um, upset that it happened. Um, you know, didn't see it coming blindside, but all those things, right? And so, yeah, I, I do, I do think for some of those guys, there is an element of it being personal, um, and and they want to go out there and and um, I, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but you know, show Paul, um, Paul Maurice uh, that uh, uh, maybe he made a mistake or whatever, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I I just think there's there, there's certainly an element for some players in that room that I think it still burns a little bit. Um, for those guys and, and, and definitely, yeah, I think, you know, if, if this is a team, you know, the Jets team that's failed at times or struggled at times, let's say, uh, to kind of manufacture emotion when there isn't really any of the game. I mean, I think they have a good foundation of some t- for tomorrow night, um, against the Panthers because it's kind of already built into it. Um, so on, on the top of just being a desperate team playing against a desperate team and needing to rise to that level. Um, you know, I think there is, you know, for some guys on this team, yeah, th- that that element of, yeah, we need to go out and beat this guy because, <laughs> you know, this isn't this is not what we wanted to have happen last year. And I think some feel that he walked out on the team. And I think, you know, it's fair to say that he did. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that burns a little bit for some of these guys. So, yeah, definitely. I think there, I think there's some added motivation. I don't know if there's money on the board and all that. You can't really say those things and all that. But you know, I, I think these guys want to go out and beat Paul because, um, you know, what it could mean for Paul's team and when obviously what it could mean for the Jets, but also just maybe a little com- personal. So. Maybe that's coming at just the right time. The other maybe. thing that Jet fans will certainly be hoping is that the Chicago Blackhawks or what's left of them decide to show up <laughs> and at least pay a test because 
they're going to be playing the night before both of these teams. Um, mm-hmm. Like tonight, it's Chicago uh, against the Panthers, and then the Jets will play the Panthers the next night. Tomorrow night, the Lightning will take on the Blackhawks, and then the next night it's the Jets. And, you know, I thought the Jets did a good job of, uh, you know, skating, doing all the things you needed to to take advantage of a team that had played the night before, albeit I think that 65-minute 0-0 battle between the Flames and Wild might be a little more, uh, (laughs) might might take a little bit more out of the team than what the Blackhawks (laughs) might. Um, But I guess we will see that going forward. Going to be a... uh, going to be a very interesting weekend for the Winnipeg Jets and uh, next week with taking on two of the best teams in hockey on the road in Carolina and back home for the Bruins. It is uh it goes without saying that this is time for, you know, this team to show themselves to step up and be the best that they can be because if they're not it ain't going to be fun talking about it next week, I can tell you on that. Yeah, no, I I mean it's not. And you know, here's the thing, right? You want to make a statement, go out and win 3 of these 4 games. Uh, win two or three on the road, maybe try and take five points on the road, gut it out. Um, you know, you win two or three on the road, you might, you know, just solidify your playoff spot, right? I mean, that's that's one of the things with this team is that, you know, they still control their own destiny and, and they have to remind themselves of that, that you just got to win some games here. Calgary's not going to win all their games down the stretch. Um, you know, I think it, it, somebody did their math. I think it's about 10 wins now out of your next 17 games that you need, you know, so you know, go play like you did in December where you went nine and seven and, and you're probably gonna, you know, you're probably going to make it into the playoffs. Right. But, but more than that, they have to win these games the right way. And we've talked about this all season. We've listened to Paul or uh, Rick bonus talk about it. Right. I mean, some of the most candid times that he's had with us in, in the media after games is when they've won a game, but he's been, he has been pissed off that they didn't win it the right way. Um, you know, right now, maybe it doesn't matter so much about how you win these games because you just need wins. Um, but you would like to see, as from a fan's perspective, and I think even in that locker room, um, head coach, all that stuff, is that, that this team um, returns to the structure and the way – because they did that. I thought they did that against the Wild. They just didn't get paid off for it. Um, but if you can start winning, like, they, this team just needs a win. And they don't need to win 7-5 against, you know, the Edmonton Oilers. They need a, you know, they need a good win where – they play in a way that, um, yeah, they they can trust the process again. I think. I mean, I, I don't know if they've they've lost the trust in the process, but it, it's spiraling, and and I they need to... lost their confidence. I think they've lost well, their confidence, yeah. and, and that, it's yeah. the offensive confidence. I mean, the scoring confidence that oh, has sure. really really evaporated yeah. over the last little while, and that's something that needs to get rectified. Stat, Scotty, yeah. have an awesome yeah. weekend. Thanks for doing this, and. Uh, yeah, enjoy the good, snow, man. Good luck enjoy with the you. Snow. Good luck. I know. How about that, Ken? Uh, Five to just, ten, right? You're just in time for the special weather statement. Ken yeah, gets yeah. out of town. What a guy. <laughs> Ken's um, outside the hotel in Florida there. Just nice breeze and a golf yeah, shirt. Off yeah. to the baseball and, game, guys. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> yeah. thanks for having me on earlier today. Uh, yeah. Anyways, have a great weekend. We'll talk next week. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how much is going to change, but uh, the dogfight is on right now and a couple huge games to get to this weekend in Florida for the Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for your time, Scotty. Yeah, anytime, guys. See you next week. Yeah. All right. Um, we uh, Actually, we do have a couple clips from Rick Bonus from practice, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Um, do want to give you a quick Briar update. Shout out to Matty Dunstone and the Manitoba team. A perfect 8-0 in the round robin. He will be playing tonight against the uh, winners of one of the two games that are going on right now to qualify for the page playoff. Brad Gushu representing Canada's defending champs, the other team waiting for the action to go. Right now at the Briar, Mike McEwen and Kevin Cooey are in a real dogfight, a wild game. Two blanked ends, Cooey took three, McEwen came back with three, and they have swapped deuces for the last four ends. They're in the ninth right now. It's 7-7 between Alberta and uh, Ontario. Loser is out. Winner moves on to tonight's matchups in the page playoff. And Botcher going up against Northern Ontario Horgan. All Botcher right now, 7-3 for the number one ranked wildcard team in uh, in the Briar. We'll wish Matt Dunstone good luck on the weekend. Of course, our curling reports are always brought to you by Princess Auto, proud sponsors of the Players' Championship, as well as Team Jennifer Jones and Team Reed Carruthers. 
and Team Mike McEwen. And of course, Princess Auto is where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them in-store, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, or you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Our friends at Culligan Water are the water experts taking care of Manitobans for over 65 years as a family-owned business. And Culligan has everything that you could possibly need, including water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, citywide water delivery services, and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Pop by and see the Culligan experts at 1200 Sargent. You can give them a call at 204-694-5180 or check them out online on everything they can do for you and your family at drinkculligan.com. And hey, a big shout out to our friends over at Canadian Club. James just from Canadian Club fired me a note today. CC and Ginger are now available in big uh, king cans, 473 milliliter single cans which are available in liquor marts and beer vendors. If you don't see it at your local spot, ask for it. They've also got a flash sale coming up from the 24th to 26th at Manitoba Liquor Marts for CC Classic 12 year. For one weekend only, they'll be on sale for $24.29. Regular price, $31.99. That's the 12 year Canadian Club Classic flash sale at Liquor Marts. And a limited re-release of the CC Chronicles 41 year old is coming up on March 18th, less than 100 available. This is the 2019 release of the Chronicles series. They found some extra cases at the distillery in Windsor. A few of them have made their way to Manitoba. So if you're missing this one in your connection, now is your chance. Pick those up at your local Manitoba liquor marts. All right, Don Callis still to come. A Friday marble race still to come. Um, but Remo, we do have a couple clips of Rick Bonus and Blake Wheeler from uh, from practice, which we should get to. Yeah, anytime you can do a media scrum outside, um, you got to do it. Wearing your like best, uh, you know, summer shirt. Uh, these guys need to get out of Winnipeg, as you said. I see people in chat. Big weather warning coming. It was I was outside before. I mean, it was pleasant, but you could feel something coming. So uh, I think it's good for these guys. Go to Florida. Step it up a little, and uh, and Bonus and Wheeler did speak after practice. Well, let's uh, start off with the coach. Uh, Bones, uh, of course, Kenny was there. Uh, mentioned that it really did seem upbeat. Let's hear what the coach had to say about uh, today's practice for the Jets before a big weekend in Florida. Yeah, no, the... Uh... The guy knows we're playing a lot better the last couple of games. Um, they know the importance of the weekend, clearly. Um, we're going to have to do so. We're going to have to get a couple of wins here. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, no one's happy with the fact we lost three of those points when we played so well, really. Um, but the most important thing is feel good about how the team game was. And the team game was very good for two, both those games. All right, Bones. Now, I, I just... I was completely distracted by those glasses. Did you see those? Yeah, there's a hanging and there's one. I guess the I guess he puts them together in the middle to wear them and then can flip them off and hang them around. I I am new to wearing glasses. These are the only ones really that I've ever had. Um, I'm not sure if you know in the chat what that style is or how those glasses work. Uh, I would be interesting. Magnet. Yeah, there it is. Um, Wow, you I, I've never seen I've never seen anything like that before. Bones. It's your boy says he's had them all season. I guess I haven't noticed them. But um anyways, we do have another clip from Bones. Uh of course, the power play has been a big, big topic of uh, consternation for the Jets lately. Uh, Bones was asked if the PP can snap out of it when they really need it. Well, that's it should be up to them, really. Um, you watch them in practice today. The puck was snapped around. They were yeah. moving it. They were scoring goals. We get in the games and we slow it down. 
So we've got to take our practice mentality into the game and they'll be a little more desperate, with a little more urgency because they can clearly do it. They do it in practice and we were, you know, we were pressuring the heck out of them. They are moving the puck. We get in the games and we slow it up too much. We hang on to it and uh, we're not moving to support each other. So when I say it's up to them and they got to do the things we're telling them to do in practice in a game. All right. Well, I mean, he's not wrong. It really is up to them. Although, uh, as I've mentioned the last little bit, I'm a little surprised that we haven't maybe seen a little, um, maybe some different personnel working with um, both the number one and the number two unit, and maybe try and get Nikolai Ehlers back in and a bit more involved in the number one unit. Although apparently, according to Ken, that was not the case today. Now, I'm really interested to hear this. I have not heard it yet. We'll play it first here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Blake Wheeler speaking, and Wheeler has not done a ton of media so far this year after no longer being the captain of the Winnipeg Jets, but as one of the, well, as the senior member of the hockey club and a guy that has been through a lot of ups and downs, he spoke today on the plight of the club, and here's Wheeler on up managing the highs and lows of the season and uh, their situation right now. Yeah, I think uh, great teams are forged in fire, so... It's a great opportunity for us to, uh, you know, stick together and deal with some adversity. What are the keys to doing that, Blake? Uh, sticking together, you know. I think uh, not, uh, you know, pointing fingers. Just, um, you know, taking responsibility for what's, uh, you know, what's transpired the last little bit. And, you know, I think the reality of the situation is there was a stretch where we we weren't playing well at all, and we kind of deserved our fate and. I think the last uh, handful of games, we've been uh, quite a bit better. And, you know, you can start to see signs of uh, the team that we had the first half of the season. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's typically what happens. You know, you start playing better and the results don't follow. And, uh, you know, we put a win streak together. And then probably towards the end of that win streak, you know, we won't be playing well. And we'll still be winning. And uh, so that, that's just typically how it works. All right. So there's uh, Blake Wheeler um, talking about staying together and not getting it together with their season on the line. Here's another clip on uh, from Wheeler on uh, if the Jets need to become more desperate. No, I mean, I think it's a tale of, you know, every stretch of the season is different. And, yeah, obviously there's things in the first part of the season that we like, but uh, it's different time of year and teams are a lot different and it's kind of ramping up for that playoff intensity. So, um, yeah, I think, like I said, I think the last handful of games, there's a lot to like in our game. and things that we can, uh, you know, draw on, you know, staying a little bit closer to home than the beginning of the season. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big part of the big stretch for us right now. Uh, one more from Blake Wheeler on uh, the absence of Pierre-Luc Dubois. Of course, um, Dubois had been recently playing in the middle of Wheeler and Nikolai Ehlers. It's uh, newcomer Vlad Nemetsnikov that's gotten the boost without Dubois. Um, Dubois will not play in Florida or Tampa. Best case scenario is he joins the club in Carolina, here's a quick bit from Wheeler on uh, dealing without the loss of one of their top centers. I mean, I think probably played our best hockey, you know, uh, ironically, when we weren't fully healthy at the right. beginning part of the season. So um, it's nothing new for our team. You know, we've been kind of battling through it all year. And, um, you know, it's it's obviously, you know, difficult when you're losing the caliber of players that we're, we're, we're missing right now. But, um, yeah, it's just a matter of guys are getting opportunities now. All right, so there's Blake Wheeler, and he does make a good point. <laughs> some of the Jets' best hockey all year long is when they had been without some of their top players, and um, well, it's time for guys to step up, and I think Nemetsnikov's looked really good so far since joining this club. He, uh, he Ehlers, and uh, Wheeler will uh, certainly need to keep things going after, uh, I think, a strong game that they played, just maybe not getting the results that they needed. All right, uh, we still have a few things to do. Don't forget... AEW tickets contest is open right now at winnipegsportstalk.com. Click on contest, follow the instructions. We'll give those away. Don Cal is coming up in just a minute. And while we've got people here, check out this in the chat. Here is the link for the Winnipeg Sports Talk Sports Trivia Night at Little Brown Jug, Wednesday, March 29th. Seating is limited. We had such a great time filling that place last time for this event. Would love to see you again. If you haven't already, click that link. If you're listening later on, it's also in the description of today's show. And uh, Remo also just put out a post on our Instagram and our Twitter 
with a link to the uh, with with the link to reserve your tickets. March 29th, Little Brown Jug. I'm putting together the questions. It is a painstaking process, but uh, a lot of fun to do it. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there. Um, and hey, I got to give a quick shout out to uh, the Nick and Nikki DQ group. We've been chowing down on our anniversary cake all week after uh, Nick was so kind to do that custom Winnipeg Sports Talk cake that we showed you on our second anniversary on Wednesday. Um, you, they can do that for you too as well. Hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. Let them know what you want on it. You can send them over a, a logo if you need, and they'll uh, have it ready for you for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. And while you're at it, you can grab one of those flamethrower burgers or maybe the honey barbecue chicken fingers, my personal favorite. Uh, four locations, DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. Big thanks to our friends at Nick and Nikki DQ. Uh, all right. We will have marbles coming up. And, uh, you know, in about halfway through this interview, we'll open up uh, the uh, entries. So be sure to pay attention to the chat when it's time to throw in exclamation mark marbles. But as we mentioned, it is a real Winnipeg homecoming on Wednesday for some of the biggest stars in professional wrestling, Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, and Don Callis himself. Yes, he used to do that show on 92 with Joey Allo and Ken back in the day. Um, he's now still one of the best characters in professional wrestling and the self-proclaimed king of Winnipeg. Let's welcome Don Callis into WST right now. Don, man, it's great to have you on the program. How are you? I'm great. Wonderful to be here and uh, pretty excited to come back to Winnipeg. The Three Kings Day, as they call it. Uh, the three biggest names in the history of Winnipeg sports. Don Callis, Kenny Omega, Chris Jericho. You want to talk about a Mount Rushmore of Winnipeg, you could throw Roddy Piper on there as well. But uh, we're very happy to come back here for the first time ever in Winnipeg. Jericho, Omega, and Don, by God, Callis in the ring at the same time. Hey, uh, you know, behind the scenes, I mean, this has been a long time coming. Um, and uh, obviously, ADW has been around for a couple years now, had that incredible debut. I mean, tons of momentum. We've all been waiting, you know, with so much Winnipeg talent in this company. When when we'd see you guys here live, that day is Wednesday. Um, from your perspective, how long has this been in the works, it coming? And, you know, for yourself and Chris and Kenny, how, uh, how personally exciting is it to, you know, get to do what you do in front of what it should be an amazing crowd downtown in uh, your hometown? Well, one of the great things about working for Tony Khan is Tony Khan is all about the fans enjoying the experience. And I think Tony recognized correctly that Winnipeg was a great market to come. I think it's going to be our hottest crowd we've ever had. And AEW has a lot of hot crowds, so that says a lot. Uh, for Chris and Kenny and I, I think it's special because, you know, Kenny Omega's uncle, the Golden Sheik, was one of my original trainers, and he was my first manager in the business when I was a young wrestler. He looked after me, and I passed on the favor and looked after Kenny, who I've known since he was 10 years old. Uh, Kenny and I, as he describes it, are family, if not by blood, then by by love and respect. So that's a big deal. And then on the other side of the equation, Chris Jericho and I have been friends since 1990. Uh, been up and down the roads as wrestlers together, whether it was in North America, Japan, Mexico. So. Um, for me, it's really cool to kind of be the Bobby Heenan to their Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens. And if you look back, uh, one of the biggest matches, in fact, in the history of wrestling was Jericho Omega at the Tokyo Dome in 2019, and uh, or rather 2018. And uh, that was, uh, you know, a group effort between me, Chris, and Kenny. Uh, I came up with the idea. I helped to uh, broker the deal with Jericho to get him in there. And uh, the rest is history. And these two guys have kind of been not in each other's lanes for the last while in AEW. But now in Winnipeg, for the first time, you're going to have Jericho and Omega in a match together with me out there with, with Kenny. And I think it's going to be great. Well, we'll get to the card in a minute. You mentioned Tony Khan. I thought you were going to mention Tony Condello there for a minute. Um, uh, you uh, <laughs> you mentioned a great AWA reference. I mean, your roots yeah. in Winnipeg wrestling goes way back. And no one will ever accuse you or either of those other two cats of uh, not paying your dues. 
No, I mean, uh, Tony Candelo uh, gave me my break in the business, and Tony was great to me. And uh, I, I would love to, to, to get Tony Candelo and Tony Khan in a room together. I think that would be great. I'd like to just sit back and, and, and listen because Tony Candelo's got great stories, and Tony Khan is a wrestling historian. I mean, he knows everything, so I think it would be very cool. Um, yeah, I mean, we came up hard back then, man. It was um, was not easy, a lot of long road trips, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, northern, uh, they used to call them the death tours up in northern Manitoba in the middle of winter. Um, and I think that's one of the ways the business has changed. Back then, um, a lot of guys, you know, didn't survive those, those types of experiences. And if you kind of came through that, that showed you that you were serious about the business. Well, um, you know, I mean, as I say, I don't think there's a, a business in entertainment where you have to uh, earn your way up more than pro wrestling. And you've certainly done that. Just before we get to the card, how did you get into it? Uh, I remember the natural. I was finishing high school and you were doing some indie mm-hmm. shows in and around Winnipeg. But um, it's been incredible. You've had a lot of other things on the go. We always remember you jumping on with Joe Aiello on that wrestling show yeah. back on 92. And I knew you jumped in the studio there today. But for folks that are unfamiliar, can you just fill us a bit on your path through this business to um, what should be an incredible night on Wednesday? Yeah, I mean, uh, I got trained in 89, and uh, I was quickly paired with Kenny's uncle, the Sheik, and I kind of did that and, uh, you know, local indie stuff and, and across Canada till about 94. Then I started going to South Africa, Germany, Puerto Rico, Lebanon, Japan, so kind of became like that international guy. Uh, signed with WWF at the time in 1997. I was there from 97 to 99. Then quickly uh, went to ECW, uh, where I was there until 2001. 2001, I retired, went back to school, got my MBA, and yes, I am the best educated person in pro wrestling with an IQ of 163, and I think that's some sort of record. Um, so uh, I went back to school, got my MBA, uh, was had, was involved in international business for 13 years, and then decided it was time to come back to wrestling, and, and here we are. And I always said the only guy that I would kind of, because I had managed Rhino to an ECW world title, I'd managed Jeff Jarrett to an NWA world title, um, but I always said the only guy I would come out of retirement as a manager to manage was Kenny Omega, and it, it worked out. Two years ago, Kenny Omega and I changed the face of ECW, or of uh, rather AEW, and uh, we've been together ever since. Now I I uh, consult with the, the Young Bucks as well, as you know, and uh, and there's another young star coming into town that I'm very excited about, which is Takashita. And uh, I am planning to roll out the Winnipeg red carpet, such as it is, uh, for Takeshita when he gets here and show him exactly what happens when you are in the orbit of the man I like to call myself the king of Winnipeg. <laughs> Don Callis is the king of Winnipeg. He'll be there along with all the stars of AEW Wrestling Wednesday at Canada Life Centre. Tickets still on sale. Pick them up if you don't have them already. Um, Don, you mentioned uh, Kenny, uh, and obviously that, that I'm glad you brought up the Jericho Omega match in Japan because for casual fans that at the time might have only really seen a WWE product on television, there seemed to be a huge growth of independent wrestling and stars that maybe had been in different spots before, but doing it on their own or going over to Japan. And that event, I mean, came on... Uh, you know, I think maybe with social media, a lot more people knew it. Um, between the Winnipeg guys, how big that event was, how form, uh, how important was that in AEW's formation? And from a from a wrestler's perspective or a manager's for guys like that, the opportunity for another elite organization to um, bring pro wrestling around the world. It's funny, you know, I've never talked to Tony Khan about it. I mean, let's be clear, without Tony Khan, uh, none of this stuff happens. And he's been, you know, a great boss and and a guy who uh, has really created an alternative for wrestling fans that was needed. But I think the Jericho Omega Dome match that I was a part of, what it really did was I think it showed not just Tony, but maybe a lot of people that there is an alternative audience here because that was the biggest match on earth that year for many, many reasons. And, you know, 40,000 people at the Tokyo Dome and the whole thing, it, it, it really helped New Japan as well. But it was like, here's this guy from New Japan, Kenny Omega, and Chris Jericho, who had left WWE and said he would never wrestle anywhere else, who came together for one night 
in Japan and all fans got exposed to New Japan. They got exposed to Kenny. They got exposed to this idea of these two guys. It was really a perfect story. And I think I can't speak for Tony Khan, but if I were him and I were watching that, I'd be like, you know what, maybe there's something here and maybe something can be done and, and, and that may have factored in. And I was just happy to be a part of it because I'm not in this business for, you know, well, I like to be, I, don't, I like wrestling. That's not why I'm here. Uh, I am here at this stage after, you know, 30 odd years in the, in the industry and, and traveled a lot of roads and done a lot of jobs. My in, in interest right now in wrestling is solely to shock people, to change history and to make things uh, better and to to rewrite the history books. Kenny, Kenny and Chris and I did it in the Tokyo Dome. Kenny and I did it two years ago in AEW, and we're fixing to do it again. Well, Don, speaking of Kenny Omega, um, it, it, it's amazing because he is such an international star, and I think there's still some people in Winnipeg that may not have been exposed to him. I mean, many people say that he is the best to do it in the business on the planet. Uh, for people that aren't familiar with Kenny Omega, tell us about, you know, this product to Winnipeg and uh, why many people, I'm sure, including you, think that he's the best. Well, I said it on Dynamite this past week. Chris Jericho is in the conversation as the greatest of all time. But in my view, right now, he's only the second best wrestler from Winnipeg. Uh, Kenny Omega is a phenomenon. I mean, I, I will say, and it's not just because Kenny and I are family, I will say that Kenny Omega is the greatest in-ring performer in the history of professional wrestling. And that's pretty special. When you think you've got someone who is the absolute best in the world at what they do, who grew up in Transcona of all places, and then you've got me, who is the absolute best in the world at what I do, which is manipulate wrestling history, which is make moments that people cry, which means rewriting the wrestling history books, You've got two guys like that, both from Winnipeg, plus Chris Jericho, who's the Madonna, the Michael Jackson of pro wrestling, whatever you want to call it. I mean, there's no other city that can talk about that. And I'm happy to be here with you because in the past, Winnipeg, the media hasn't always embraced these stars. Chris Jericho is by far the most well-known name from Winnipeg. Don't talk to me about Neil Young, a Kelvin High School alum, or Ken Finkelman, or, or Monty Hall, or, or Burton Cummings. More people know who Chris Jericho is. And for that reason, I think Winnipeg should be rolling out the red carpet. I know the fans are, and I'm happy to be here with you because I think it's good when the media talks about, hey, we got guys here who are the best in the world at what they do, and how many cities can say that? Well, and we're going to get a chance to see, as you mentioned at the beginning of this interview, Jericho and Omega in the same match. This is going to be insane. A trios championship match with the House of Black Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, the Elite, and Chris Jericho and the Jericho Appreciation Society. Tee this one up for people, what they will see if they get a ticket and come down on Wednesday for what will be uh, I mean, a spectacle without a doubt. That's going to be, in my opinion, the greatest wrestling match in the history of Winnipeg wrestling. And that covers a lot of ground because I was there for Flair Bockwinkle, you know. So this is going to be the best match, the biggest match ever when Kenny and Chris collide in this match. The House of Black, I'll, I'll give them credit. Uh, they really kicked the hell out of us uh, at Revolution and took those trios titles. So they're on fire right now. You know, my guys would like to get back in and prove a point. They're going to try to do that in Winnipeg. And, of course, the Jericho Appreciation Society. So um, I don't ever recall a, a, a nine-man, if you want to call it that, three trios teams together, certainly not in, EC, or in, in AEW. So I'm super excited about that. And actually, I'll, I'll say this. I'm almost as excited about something else, and only because, you know, I don't manage him, but – MJF and the rebar mitzvah. I mean, that's going to be phenomenal. I have no idea what's going to happen. I've, I would love to be a part of it. I don't know what I can do. I need to bring a gift. But uh, an MJF coming off just a phenomenal 60 minute Ironman match with Brian Danielson. So that's going to be amazing. And then the, the newly coined AEW International Championship. Uh, Orange Cassidy is going to be defending that belt against none, none other than Jeff Jarrett. So you're going to get to see all of the stars. The Young Bucks are going to be there. And I just want, when, when Kenny Omega's music hits, I want people to just go crazy. And I think Winnipeg is going to be the best crowd we've ever had, which, as I said earlier, covers a lot of ground when you're talking AEW. 
Yeah, I don't think you're going to need to prod the uh, the fans to do that. The, they are ready right now. and We're days away from the event. I, I, I'm glad you brought up MJF. He is the AEW world champion. Um, you've been an incredible heel for the majority of your career. MJF is one of the best on the microphone. I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this young man and his rise to um, have the belt right now as the, uh, as the champion right now of AEW. I, I think... MJF is uh, is a phenomenon. I mean, in a different way than Kenny is. I mean, MJF came in much like I did at, at his age. I was known for my talking. Um, and uh, I think MJF, I give him a lot of credit. I think a lot of people were saying before this Ironman match, well, you know, he's a great talker. He gets good ratings. He looks great. But, you know, can he hang with Brian Danielson? And I'll tell you, uh, if you watch that match, um, it wasn't the Brian Danielson show. I mean, Brian was phenomenal. But MJF, I think, answered a lot of the the quote unquote critics that wondered, um, and he delivered what I think was the greatest Iron Man match in the history of wrestling, and that, as you know, covers a lot as a wrestling fan. You know, Brett Shawn, and um, so this has just been a great thing for the company, and I'm very happy for Max because, uh, you know, Max and I are a little bit similar. We're both people who don't like wrestling fans very much. Uh, we don't care for people, and we don't suffer fools. So uh, I'm super happy for Max. And, and this rebar mitzvah thing, like, I have no clue. But this might be the biggest celebration since the Jets won the Stanley Cup. Oh, wait, that's never happened and never will. Sorry. <laughs> Don Callis is with us on Winnipeg Sports Talk. AEW is on Wednesday. Um, mission MJF, there's a, some incredible female talent in AEW as well. Jade Cargill's coming. Open challenge for her TBS championship, calling out all of the Canadian talent north of the border from the women's side. Can anyone beat Jade Cargill? Let just fill us in a little bit on uh, on her and what fans will see uh, when she brings that incredible winning streak to the peg. Listen, athletically, I don't think there's, there's any, maybe man or woman, that can match Jade Cargill. She's a special athlete. She's a freak athlete. There's no question. Uh, And I think Jade Cargill has taken to the wrestling business very quickly. Now, Jade was a high-level college basketball player, so she understands coaching. She understands what needs to be done. She understands preparation. So um, do I think there's anyone that can beat her? There's always someone who can beat somebody. And I think Jade Cargill's biggest risk is herself. She talked about getting a little bit bored of mowing down opponents. You can't get bored. You can't lose focus in a company like AEW that has so much female talent in this case. Um, you could you could lose very quickly. And uh, I worry about Jade. I don't know who she's listening to at this point in terms of, of getting advice. But um, if you look at just the physical, and she's very intelligent as well, um, she may be undefeated for a long time. I may be retired by the time someone beats her. I don't know. I'm planning on sticking around at least for another 30 years, though, so we'll see. <laughs> AEW Dynamite is on Wednesday night. The Winnipeg homecoming for Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, our guest Don Callis. What time do you guys get the key to the city on Wednesday before this goes can, down? Can, can I can I do a little mean gene? Ladies and gentlemen, or maybe it's a Joel, I don't know. But it's a mean gene. It's ladies and gentlemen, get your tickets at awtix.com at the Canada Life Center. Doors open 5 p.m. Central, showtime, and that's a live dynamite. On the Ides of March and the birthday of MJF, showtime, 6 o'clock. It's going to be the greatest time ever in Winnipeg at a wrestling event. I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited. Looking forward to seeing you there and all the fans here in Winnipeg. Uh, It's the one day that I may be nice to fans. Don't approach me or make eye contact the other 364 days a year. Don, you're the best. Cannot wait for Wednesday. Thanks for doing this and uh, continued success to you, the Winnipeg guys, and everyone at All Elite Wrestling. Thanks, buddy. All right. That was awesome. Don Callis. I have been a longtime fan of Don's. He, uh, what an interview and uh, what an event that is going to be. Don't forget, if you just tuned in, maybe you were coming in a little late in time for the marble race. We have one more pair of AEW tickets. We're giving them away through a contest on the website. So get over to winnipegsportstalk.com. Click on contest. Get your entries in. If you're listening on the podcast, folks, you'll have all weekend to get it in. Basically up until Monday morning, we will announce the winner at the end of Monday's show here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. And we'll look forward to seeing our previous winners as well as Monday's winner 
at the big event on Monday night. Of course, you can also get tickets through Ticketmaster. If you are at all, even if you're not a wrestling fan, to be honest, this is going to be so much fun, such a great spectacle. And when you add in Don and, of course, Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega coming back home for the first time in a long time, AEW has never performed in Winnipeg before. Uh, it's going to be a hell of a night at Canada Life Center. So hopefully we can uh, see you there. But uh, as I said, get to the website, winnipegsportstalk.com, click on contest and get your entries in. And make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel because uh, you'll get an extra entry for that as well. Um, by the way, I also mentioned that we do have the, uh, and I'll just throw it in one more time if you're with us, uh, tickets for the sports trivia night at Little Brown Jug. Make sure to get those. And if you're listening on the pod, you can go to the YouTube description for a link or winnipegsportstalk.com slash links to uh, get on over to the Eventbrite listing that uh, Little Brown Jug has created. And we will see you there on the 29th of March. Man, big Wednesdays coming up. We got a couple Wednesdays from now. Or next Wednesday is AEW. Two weeks after that, our second ever Little Brown Jug Sports Trivia Night. Um, all right, last call for marbles, everybody. If you came in a little uh, a little late, um, get them in right now. Remo, let me ask you, uh, do, are, are you familiar with a rebar mitzvah? What can you tell us? Uh, what can you tell us uh, about that? <laughs> <laughs> My friends and I who are going, we're very excited for the rebar uh, mitzvah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Is he gonna read from the Torah? I'm not. I'm not sure what it involves. Is he gonna say uh, a bracha, a blessing? We'll have to. We'll have to wait and see. Um, well, I don't know. It's uh, he really hyped it up for me. So I know uh, MJF's a heel, but as a Jewish brother, I might have to cheer for him. Hey, you know what? He's got a lot of fans. He's uh, the best on the mic um, in. Made probably the business right now. Don's right there as well. And Tyson Ducharme, last time I went to wrestling was with Hustler at the Central. Yes, CWE, back in Tikona. What an event that was. Tyson told me all of the great stories of rookies back in the day and the fact that they haven't changed a damn thing in that place in the better part of the last 25 years. It's what indie wrestling is all about. Um, all right, Reem. Well, let's uh, let's get to it. You want to uh, wrap up the uh, wrap up sure. entries, and we can get going for uh, get going for marbles. Yes, I will uh, wind down the list, and we, I don't know if we have any other stuff. We well, touch on, so, oh, every, everyone in chat saying we need the rabbi to ask him what a re bar mitzvah yeah. is. That's Matt Libel. <laughs> Libel, exactly. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Libel will be involved. Yeah, he is the uh, he is the most prominent prominent rabbi in the Winnipeg sure. sports community. It would make a lot of sense if uh, somehow Libel was involved with MJF we, in the rebar mitzvah that is taking place on we, AEW. On uh, we have their PR contact information. Like, hey, if you need a rabbi uh, for this, we know <laughs> we one. He's the let sports, them know. the sports rabbi. Yeah, I'll email. I'll email. I don't know if they're watching, but. That's actually a great, great idea. Um, hey, one thing I do want to mention, we're going to be uh, looking forward to hopefully doing a bunch of things with the Gold Eyes this year for Winnipeg Sports Talk listeners. And uh, yeah, I know we're going to get some snow this weekend, but spring is around the corner. Um, obviously, the huge news with the fish uh, in the last month or so was the departure of Steve Schuster, who did such an incredible job filling the uh, size 22s of Paul Edmonds when he moved from the Gold Eyes to the being the voice of the Winnipeg Jets. Well, the Gold Eyes announced today the hiring of veteran broadcaster Doug Greenwald as the club's new play-by-play -play voice on their broadcast at CNJU 93.7 FM. This guy comes with a ton of experience. He spent the last 20 seasons with the Fresno Grizzlies who until 2021 were members of the AAA Pacific Coast League. He's called regular season games for the San Francisco Giants, in addition to broadcasting their spring training games for 12 years. And this is in the family as well. Greenwald's late father, Hank Greenwald, enjoyed a major career as a major league broadcaster spanning 18 seasons with the Giants, Yankees, and Athletics. And uh, Andrew Collier, I'll just read a quote from this. Gold has a long history of great broadcasters, 
It was important to the organization that we provide our fans with someone that will not only call a great game, but will also represent the Gold Eyes to the level we've come to expect. I'm looking forward to listening to Doug this season as a new era of Gold Eyes baseball begins. And it really is, Remo, a new era of Gold Eyes baseball. I mean, listen, the ballpark's still going to be great. There's nothing like baseball in the summer in downtown Winnipeg on the banks of the red. Um, but with a new manager and a new play-by-play voice, this is, for a team that has had so much continuity, um, pr- two pretty significant changes. That being said, I think they hit a home run, to use a baseball uh, euphemism, uh, with this new hire for a guy that has so much experience. What a coup for the team. Yeah, wow. What a addition. And uh, didn't, doesn't the new manager also have uh, some ties to the San Francisco Giants as well? So Yeah, well, he was just there working in their system last year, but wanted to get back to a place where kind of wins and losses, I think, mat- matter a little bit more. So, yeah, crazy. The, the offseason here for the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, not – uh, on the field, but uh, the broadcast booth and manager. So um, big. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. I'm looking forward to getting out to the ballpark uh, this year. Huh? So hopefully uh, it'll warm up soon. Yeah, no doubt about it. And hey, if you do want information on fish season tickets, group outings, 10 game mini packs, get on over to the website at goldeyes.com. Just keeping an eye on this curling matchup. They're into the 10th end between Mike McEwen and Kevin Cooey. Uh, I do believe that, yeah, the uh, wild card uh, botcher team has won. They're in the books at 8-5. Mike McEwen has the hammer, is down one right now, and uh, is uh, is about to make a shot. He's got his, uh, his hits. I can tell you they are going down, I believe this is the last rock. So what do we have here? We have a, oh, he did it. (laughs) Wow. Mike McEwen with a wild, was that a double takeout? I'm not sure. Bottom line is they came back from three down to beat Kevin Cooey. Big, big upset for Team Ontario. So uh, Mike McEwen on a bit of a roll right now at the Briar. He, of course, from Manitoba, representing Ontario as the import now we've got Brad Gushu, Brendan Botcher, and Matt Dunstone uh, left. Much like AEW with a lot of Winnipeg flavor. Got a lot of Winnipeg flavor in this Briar weekend that uh, is now down to four teams. Yeah, Winnipeg, that's what we're good at here. Us. Hockey, professional wrestling, and curling. I think those are big, the biggest exports here uh, from Winnipeg. Uh, although, as Don mentioned, shout out to at Burton Cummings and Neil Young, who went to high school here for one year. Don't forget that it was the best year of his life. Yeah, well, apparently he's ours, is, but, Neil Young. But you- but I, but Don is absolutely right. I mean, I know there was a lot of hyperbole in what he was saying. Chris Jericho is the biggest international star out of Winnipeg, and I don't even think it's close. Yeah, Some no, people I that's don't what I'm respect too. the sweet science and the art of sports entertainment. Might not agree. Um, listen, while you get that ready, Players Championship is continuing. Um, John Rom with the WD uh, illness and the world number one is out of the tournament. Now, the projected cut line is one over par, which is bad news for the likes of uh, two guys that I picked, Justin Thomas and Shane Lowry. Not looking good. Matt Fitzpatrick's also likely going to miss the cut at three over par. But up at the top of the leaderboard, we have a new leader. Christian Bezadenhut, the South African. He is three under par for his round today. He's at seven under. Three. Uh, three players at six under, including Canadian Adam Svensson. Two under on his round. He had an opening round 68. He's tied at six under with Ben Griffin and Colin Morikawa. Uh, Minwoo Lee at five under par. Round one leader, Chad Gamey at five under par, and there is uh, Jason Day at four under. Taylor Pendrith, our pal from uh, our cool bet pal, he is at uh, four under par. He's one over on his round so far. Scotty Scheffler, four under as well. So, uh, Oh, and there's Adam Hadwin, two under right now. He's at three under. So uh, four, three Canadians in the top 14 right now at the Players' Championship. Uh, and with a few top dogs out, going to be a really, really interesting 
for the biggest PGA Tour event every year outside, of course, of the four major championships. Yeah, well, I got uh, moving on. I do have the marble names in. Uh, I don't know if we wanted to add anyone else, Huss. Uh, I did put in Don Callis. That's in there. Yeah, I think we go uh, Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho get a marble too. Put them all in, sure. As well. The ho homecoming marbles for the guys. And we are going to be at the show. Uh, I don't know. Are we getting a sign ready? Has someone asked where we were sitting? And I was like, you have the tickets. I actually don't. I don't know. But I'll be there. We'll be checking out the merch stand too. I don't know what, what kind of merch they have. But uh, I'm sure it'll, sure it'll be good, Huss. Are you going to get an AEW championship oh, belt if to they go along with your junior WWE championship belt that um, you, of course, got when you, me, and Ezzy were at the event? Ezzy Ginsburg will also be with the WST crew yeah. for the event. If there. there's a belt, I'll expense it to the company. If it can yeah. be part of my stream background. Yeah, WST <laughs> will pay for pay for my child my child belt. Sure. I'll, <laughs> we'll take a look. I would. What does the AEW belt look like? Is it good? Uh, well, the new one has a Burberry theme, the Burberry belt, because, of course, it's MJFs. It goes along with the scarfs and uh, whatnot. Kabil Kabilis and Shaq can probably tell us uh, a little bit more in there. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's get to it. We've got uh, we've got a marble race today. And by the way, I want to give a big thanks to a good friend of mine, Scott Shippum and Ronnie Roberts over at Shippum and Associates, Winnipeg's premier promotional products company, uh, because they're coming on board with WST as a bit of a sponsor, helping us uh, outfit all of our marble race winners. So, yes, I know we were running low on a number of sizes. Anchor won last week. We didn't have his size. So probably looking at about two and a half weeks or so, um, but anyways, we still will have it. We'll just get the winner's names. And then when everything uh, comes in, we'll be able to back order a few winners. So you might have to wait a couple weeks uh, if you win today. But we do have new hoodies on the way from our friends at Ship and Associates. And uh, we really appreciate those guys coming on board with us to help us continue outfitting Winnipeg Sports Talk listeners with our version of the Masters Green Jacket for winning the marble race on WST on Friday afternoons. Um, all right. What, uh, what's the word, Remo? Where are we going today? Getting it loaded in here. I do have to play the theme song. I don't know if there's a particular version you're a fan of. Uh, I'm... Uh, you know what? I think, you know, we've got enough uh, dealer's choice. Just try Just mix it up from, uh, from what we've got before. By the way, Page seating tonight matchups. Mike McEwen is going to go up against Brad Gushu, and Brendan Botcher will be the opponent for eight and O. Matt Dunstone. Um, the winner of those matches will go to the one-two game, uh, where you win and you go straight to the final of the Briar on Sunday. Yeah, well, I'm all set here for the uh, marble race. So. Ben Howard, Remy Shand is the biggest Winnipeg star, and it's not close. That's a good song. Uh, take a message. I think I threw it up on Spotify earlier. Is that what it was? Yeah, this nice little. Uh, was that? Was he basically just a one-hit wonder? Did anything happen? Yeah, but it was Remy a pretty damn awesome song. I mean, did he have other songs? I don't. I don't remember. I I I don't know either. Uh, listen, I'm still I'm still firmly in the camp of Jericho being our number one export. Um, all right. Well, listen, let's uh, hear the tune from the, uh, maybe Tristan Rivers music could be one of our great exports because of what he's done for the digital space of Winnipeg sports talk shows. Uh, it's not Marvel's time until we hear from Tristan on WST.
easy listening sounds of that version of the Marble Race song by Tristan Rivers Music. I think that was the Michael McDonald. As, as Tyson just mentioned, talked a lot of Transcona today. The Flamingos in there, a little bit of Transcona flavor in it. Um, that actually is one of my favorites, Reem. We haven't listened to that one in a while. Great choice today, especially with the snow coming. Can at least take us to a to a better place right now with um, not quite springtime weather here in Winnipeg. Yeah, officially it's that's the Christopher Cross version, but you know Michael McDonald spot oh, Christopher on. Cross, that's right. Do Do we brothers and people enjoying the Florida theme in the background because the Jets are in Florida. So if you're on the podcast, you're gonna have to watch the video accompanying the uh, Marvel song. Uh, okay, what about, um, what's the Mountain Mingle there, Reem? Number 45. I don't know. Have we done that one before? Probably. We've done them. I don't know if it's good. We can take a look. we got 189 marbles. 189. And if Don wins, we'll have to you know, get in touch with him to give him his hoodie. Although, I don't know Absolutely. if he's a hoodie guy. Absolutely. Oh, uh, I don't think this one's very good. Okay. We'll get back. Let's go to this one. What about uh, what about Frozen? I'm good with because we're frozen here. Well, we're going to be frozen a little bit more as well coming up in the next. Uh, I think that was it was oh. like right beside it. It was like 44 or something like that. You know what? Good thing we got out of that because I didn't actually add the names in. So oh, perfect. Let's make perfect. sure that we get all 189. There we go. Um, Frozen. I think it was like 44 or something like that. Here we take a look. Frozen. I don't know. This is a long one. I don't Perfect. think that's slippery slope. No, slippery slope. That is a great one. That is a good one. I don't know if I don't know this one. It's big big storm though. Should we do this one? Ah, it's snowing. Yeah, and it's a long one too. So uh here we go, folks. Good luck to everybody. Playing for one of our new, uh, well, they will be new. The winner today will get one of our first of the new batch of uh, Marbles Championship hoodies for Winnipeg Sports Talk from our great friends at Shipham and Associates. If you need any promo products, hit them up. Tell them the Winnipeg Sports Talk boys sent you. Um, it's going to snow tomorrow, but the special weather statement has come to Winnipeg Sports Talk a day early, just in time for the Marbles race. Just about 200 in it. Good luck to everyone. Let's drop them and see what happens on WST. The race has started. The big Plinko start today for the uh, the Frozen. Jeff Kabilis with a nice uh, a nice start. This is a crazy track. Oh wow! This is have we done this one before? I think we might Maybe have done like it a once. Long, cause... long time ago, or something like that. Yeah, not recently. Well, this is good. Al Broderick with a nice start. Devin Ramsey looking good. A B is that Antonio Brown? <laughs> Arena Arena Football League owner Antonio Brown. A B. Uh, Les Thompson. Les is a former winner. Oh look at Jerry Brown making moves. T T T T Bone as well over on the other side. But I do think that Jerry Brown has a bit of a lead right now. Um, we've got marbles on both sides. Oh Jerry just stalled a little bit. Maybe hit a bit of a snowbank. And now we've got a uh, a flurry. Although no one's... Is that the Gitch? Gitch Lishka in first place, I see, over on the right side. Looking pretty darn good. Oh, yeah, this is a good track we had today. Now, as we get going, there's going to be a few more obstacles. But right now, we've got uh, Sean Lishka. Oh, and I think Rob Kane's right there in the mix, too. What happened to Rob? Rob, we might see a little later on this afternoon. Uh, moose two, moose three. Now we're moving back down. Let's see who's first stop. It is Sean Lishka. I'm not sure that Gitch has ever won the marble race before. He's certainly a very loyal listener of WST. Um, and you've got a bit of a lead here right now. Now, he's going to be coming around this corner does look like there is some obstacles. Oh, he navigated them quite well, but it is, it's getting closer. It's getting closer right now. We don't really see what's happening on the other side, but right now, one of our most popular chatters, the Gitch, Sean Lishka, does look like he is in first place. Theo Seegers in the mix as well. And well, now we're getting into some very, very heavy snow. 
Uh, it's cleaned up a little bit. Who is it? Disgruntled wheat now in the front. Hewichenko in front. And now I'm not sure what happens here. It goes now into this snowflake. Oh, no, it has to just keep on going past. It's still more, but it's just heavy snow. We cannot see. Everything is. This is anybody's race. We're getting. We're seeing some leaders get slowed up a little bit and the rest of the pack coming through. But right now, Alex Howe looks to be in first place. I think Lisa Fowler, Hewichenko as well. But Alex Howe in first place, although Hugh seems to be picking up a little pace. This is going down. Hugh! Ah, oh, could it be? Hewichenko passing Alec Howe. And there it is. Hewichenko. <laughs> Nicely done, Hugh. Met Hugh at a game. I think it was last season. Mentioned that he loves the show. And uh, we see Hugh in all the time. Many marble races. And finally now a winner. A champion of the Friday afternoon marble race here on WST. <laughs> Rest of the top ten is Trevor Thicket, Alex, uh, uh, Alex Howe, um, what is that, Ben Bryant? Nia Siegel in the mix there. Frosty. Or what are you Siegel looking at, is fourth. Jack Hole. Well, it's just so pixelated on my screen. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but the running man in fourth, Alex Howe finished sixth. Sean Lishka, eighth. Patrolman Pete. Big ice fan. Don't forget, tonight is the bomber night at the ice game, guys. Um, ice go for win number 51 on the season. And uh, BA Split just got in. We're still waiting for... Oh, Brass Balls Blake. Our final marble in. Well, Frozen, that was a good one. We'll have to do that one again sometime. Uh, but Hugh Wachenko, Hugh, way to go. All your perseverance is paid off. You are a Marbles champion on WST. Send us an email, winnipegsportstalk at gmail.com. Let me know what size you are. We might have one for you right now, but if we don't, hang tight. And as I said, the good folks at Shipham have the WST Marbles hoodies on the way. We will have them in a couple weeks. Uh, yes, I do. See, I have glasses, but I don't have the ones like Bones has. Uh, it's your boy, Bruce problem is that when this thing gets when there's so many marbles in on the program feed inside the wst uh computers well there's roscoe at uh, number uh number 110 we'll just keep going down and make sure everyone's <laughs> side bets get paid off we'll see if bozeman's ahead or behind him um yeah sometimes it's a little bit hard to see but uh okay. it's all good now that we're running rob kane had a nice run ended up finishing 147th i don't know how that happened uh dino we see val george chuckers in there dave asplin free oleg 170 not a great marble race for oleg today uh don callis don come on and ab ab was leading at the start and ended up finishing what 185th uh but ba split not last brass balls blake last place today um all right great stuff today well, now we can get back to getting ready for these games on the weekend, Reem. Um, I was pretty down, as many fans were yesterday, but uh, I don't know. We'll see what this team is made of over this uh, course of the next little bit. That could be scary to some people who think that uh, that's, uh, we've seen what they're made of, but I think there's a lot more. And, hey, they have played better. Maybe they get uh, a couple things to go their way and get a result. And who's sweeter to beat? and Paul Maurice and the Florida Panthers. I'm sure a lot of fans feel that way. And from talking to Billick, sounds like quite a few players probably feel that way as well. Biggest game of the year. This <laughs> is uh, the defining moment of the Winnipeg Jets season. Uh, could it be the TSN turning point where they flip the script? It's funny, my, who, uh, Micah Blake McCurdy on Twitter, he does hockey analytics, showed a graph of playoff probabilities and you know, the Jets are like up there and then all of a sudden like fall fall off a cliff. Uh, maybe they can reverse the trend. Here, check out this one, Hus. It's Yeah, I don't pretty... know. Do we I should should maybe we save that? I, I'm not sure that we should finish the show showing the graph of what's happened to the playoff odds over the last little while. Oh. 
then close your eyes. Don't look. But there oh is. Oh my god. Look at that. Yeah. Well, Not. and to be honest, I mean, his numbers probably don't even come to show what they were earlier this season. I mean, I think they were way higher than where this graph starts at right now. So, so whatever, it's still 67.8, lots of hockey left, but got to get some wins. And we're better to start it off than South Florida. I'm sure there'll be some Jet fans that made the trip down for the weekend. I certainly wish I did. Uh, but no, we're here. Special weather statement. But we got the players championship during the day we've got the great manitoba flavor at the briar good luck to maddie dunstone tonight and on the weekend and uh let's think positive folks let's get back here here on monday talk about some good results for the winnipeg jets in two very difficult road games and then get ready for the uh, road trip finale for the uh, for the carolina hurricanes aew on wednesday and then the boston bruins on thursday here in winnipeg going to be a hell of a week don't forget, enter for those AEW tickets, our last pair, winnipegsportstalk.com slash contest. We'll be announcing the winner on Monday at the end of the program. So you've got all weekend to get into the contest. Um, thanks so much to everyone for making us a part of your day. Have a great weekend. Hopefully you won't spend too much time shoveling and the dump won't be as bad as some are fearing probably getting 10 sand readers or snow i think that's probably safe to assume uh but i'll tell you what give us 30 centimeters but a couple jet wins i would actually take it right now that's where we're at um thanks to our guest today don Callis from aew wrestling ken weeb scott billick great stuff from remus to get those clips from bones and wheeler during the program and uh, thanks to everyone that joined us today and congratulations to hugh Wichenko, our marbles winner tonight um folks we'll be back monday one o'clock wrapping the whole weekend for the winnipeg jets looking ahead to a huge week for the hockey club with carolina and boston on the docket after these two games in south florida stay warm stay out of the snow and join us Monday on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Have a great weekend. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.